Agangelos. This floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, allow me to present a completely different concept. And the concept is, if it's possible, that the reaction of our body to whatever stimulus may, may have catastrophic consequences. <coughs> this is my conflict of interest disclosure for the presentation. And I would like, first of all, to elaborate on the definition of danger associated molecular patterns. So these are endogenous molecules, which serve as potent activators of the immune system. This is the definition. But before jumping on which these endogenous molecules may be, I would like you to bring you back during the studies, the first year of medical studies, when biology was part of the curriculum of education, and all of us then, we were listening to someone who was calling himself evolutionary biologist, telling that evolution means that in order to have a eukaryotic cell, you are in need of two bacterial cells who are mer that are merging, and one of them becomes a mitochondria. In other term, if a eukaryotic cell is disrupted, it may release substances which look like, they're not exactly the same, but they look like bacteria. What can be these substances? Mitochondrial DNA, high mobility group box one. The DNA has proteins for coiling. Some are the histones and non-histones. One typical non-histone is high mobility group box one, ATP and monosodium urate. How are they released? So a cell may die abruptly due to necrosis. It may die because of apoptosis. Then there are not really much traits behind him, but when a cell is destroyed through necrosis, you see that all of a sudden it releases all intracellular constituents. And also something very important, we talk about extracellular traps and we think for them as being inflammatory mediators, but look what is happening when the neutrophil opens and releases the extracellular traps. And these are actually the nets are a type of danger associated molecular patterns. Let's see then what they can do. Many years ago, almost 20 years ago, a famous uh, biology, uh, biochemist from uh, Lausanne, uh, Jörg Chop, elaborated the concept that all there should be a very smoldering inflammatory response when this happens, and only when there is an excess of dumps, there can be danger. And he concentrated on that, on what we call today the inflammasome, which, is, which are proteins that are inactive, and all of, a sense, all of a sudden, when they realize that there is a presence of dumps, they can be activated, they can assemble, and they can activate caspase 1, and this hydrolyzes pro-IL-1 beta to the active IL-1 beta. Exactly, this is happening with the mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondrial DNA introduces a lot of production of IL-1 beta through the activation of NALP3 inflammasome. So allow me to tell you more or less what is the concept and how we know that IL-1 beta is the main producer coming from stimulation with dumps. This is one of the dump, which is called NMIC and STAT Interactor. This is a relatively recent publication at Nature Communication. And these are mice with LPS sepsis. At time zero, they are stimulated with endotoxin. And you see that we have wild mice and mice with, who are uh, homogeneous deficient in NMI. And all of a sudden, you see that the mice which are knocked out for NMI, they survive better, which means that there is a synergy between the LPS and this NMI, which is an endogenous product for death. So let's isolate tissue macrophages from, actually these are splenocytes, isolated from these mice. In black bars are the wild type. In Y, it are mice 
which are deficient, knocked out for TLR4, and let's stimulate them with LPS. As it is anticipated, you get much less IL-6. And let's stimulate them also with NMI. And the produced IL-6 is also lower, which means that TLR4 is a receptor for this dump. Another dump from the same publication, interferon-induced protein gamma. And uh, stimulation, ex vivo stimulation of bone marrow-derived macrophages with PBS in white or Salmonella tifimurium in uh, the, uh, dark bars produce much more IFP35. So Salmonella tifimurium can stimulate the production of this dump from the macrophages. The question is, again, the same thing. Is this important? Does this synergize with bacterial pumps in order to induce death? And here you see mice challenged IV with LPS, wild type, and knocked out for IFP35, and they knocked out, they have a better survival. So the answer again is yes. Let's move to another field, COVID-19, calprotectin. Calprotectin is produced by the neutrophils, and these are measurements of calprotectin early, during hospital admission. At the time of hospital admission, no dyspnea, no sign of severity. And after we knew what happened to the patients, we split them into healthy volunteers, those who did not develop severe respiratory failure after 14 days, those who developed severe respiratory failure after 14 days or who died. And we see that from the very beginning, calprotectin is increased in humans. And next thing was, we are in need of a biomarker which can demonstrate those who have more calprotectin and those who have low calprotectin. And the biomarker that we use mm -hmm. is called SUPAR. And you see that patients who are on admission, they have su SUPAR six or more, they have much more circulating calprotectin. So if calprotectin or dams are to do the dirty job and to induce severe respiratory failure, then all what we have to do is to get plasma from humans and to stimulate mice and to see if we could get an inflammatory pattern similar to COVID-19. Some could say, but how is this possible? We know that having a humanized model of COVID-19 is much difficult because mice, they lack ACE2. So we don't have here mice which has been transformed in order to be able to express ACE2, but immediately we infuse them the dumps, IV, either plasma from healthy volunteer or plasma from a patient who developed severe respiratory failure. And look what you get when you sacrifice them. An increased production of TNF in the lung, an increased production in the gut, no changes in kidney and in liver. And then we repeated the experiment. I apologize for the mistake. I missed the one uh, before alpha. And uh, we gave pretreatment along immediately after injecting uh, the plasma and through a different route, a monoclonal, which is blocking calprotectin. And you see that the difference does not exist anymore. And then we tried to give treatment to uh, our mice by giving an akinra, which is blocking both L1 alpha and L1 beta. And you see that there is an attenuation of the inflammation in the colon. But again, the question comes, is this an effect through production of L1 beta of, or of L1 alpha or of both? Then we addressed to a biotech in uh, uh, America and they are producing a humanized uh, monoclonal for the L1 alpha of humans and also a monoclonal for the L1 alpha of mice. And you see that the human monoclonal works, inflammation is attenuated, the murine does not work, which means that the injection containing calprotectin and L1 alpha is the one which is driving the patients into severe respiratory failure. And this leads us to the hypothesis that the virus which is rapidly <coughs> uh, invades the lungs it binds to ACE2. This leads to rapid production inside 
the human epithelial cells of the lower respiratory tract, and they release dumps. And these two main dumps, which can be either IL-1 alpha or calprotectin, on their part, calprotectin leads to the production of IL-1 beta and IL-1 alpha and IL-1 beta together. They act on the receptor of IL-1 and they sting off on the alveolar macrophage and this triggers inflammation. However, what is really tricky in all this vicious cycle of L1 alpha and L1 beta production is that you know L1 is the endogenous pyrogen. And uh, there is an attempt coming from our human body to constrain that so that fever is not really high. And there is a production of an endogenous antagonist, L1 array, which binds to the receptor in order for this not to be overdone. So, the question is, we have a biomarker. It demonstrates, SUPAR is the biomarker, who are the patients who are under the attack of dams at the level of the emergency department. So, once we can use the biomarker to early recognize the patients who are under the attack of dams, then we need to give immediate treatment to block L1 alpha and L1 beta in order to decrease their likelihood for unfavorable outcome, but also to improve the cure rate and to avoid, if possible, long COVID. We call that the safe strategy. And the idea is for patients who are borderline in their oxygenation and, we, and who have increased levels of SUPAR, they get immediate treatment with a recombinant form of the receptor antagonist, which is called anakinra, and through this approach, if we deliver the antagonist, we may block both L1 alpha and L1 beta. The very end of the pathway was the approval of this strategy and the registration of the drug at the end of December 2021 by the European Medicines Agency. This is the labeling, patients with radiologically documented pneumonia by COVID, need of oxygen, low flow or high flow, and super six or more. The indication was led by a phase two trial, which was platform-like. And at the end of the trial, it was a phase two on almost 1,000 patients. We, we asked and we received advice by the COVID ETF of the European Agency. And then we ran a randomized phase three trial according to the guidance that we received from the agency. The overall benefit of the phase two program in favor of the drug was 70% and of the phase three program was 64%. And allow me to present you the endpoint. Patients by day 28, they can be either have an outcome of gray, which means that there are no symptoms. The, viral, the virus has, uh, is negative, the PCR. They can be in green, which means that there is persistence of symptoms. They can be in the uh, orange zone or the yellow zone, which means that they remain hospitalized under oxygen departments, or they may have died. The odds ratio is 0.36, which means that there is this 64% overall benefit coming from anakinra treatment. Recently, we published a subgroup analysis of our data, trying to identify if there is a subgroup of patients who will get most of benefit or whether all patients should receive the treatment. And you see that if CCI is two or more or less than two, there is no difference. There are differences according to the level of SUPAR, both patients with SUPAR between six or nine or more than nine, they get the same benefit, males, females, elderly, non-elderly, and also the same benefit, no matter how the delay from start of symptoms until start of treatment is. Survival by day 90, was something favoring the drug by, uh, oh, I apologize how I go back. Probably it's that one. Okay. Uh, there was, as you have seen, a 51% relative decrease of mortality. The mortality rate was 10% in the placebo group, 5% in the Anakimra group. With these findings, I would like to end with some concluding remarks. Danger associated molecular patterns, they stimulate strong innate immune responses. The agonists for them are TLR4 and the LAL3 inflammasome, and they drive excess L1 
production. As far as COVID-19 is concerned, we produced evidence that some of the patients who progress into severe respiratory failure, this pathway starts early through increase of calprotectin and IL-1 alpha. SUPAR is a biomarker which can be used as a recognition of the early dump production, and this may guide early treatment with anakinra in order to limit the effect of dumps and improve short-term and long-term outcomes. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Evangelos, for this impressive uh, summary of your findings. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? So um, let me ask you, what happens to patients who have high variable load and not a very high SUPAR level? Well, in how this do they in, in how would they react to anakinra? So in these patients, we do not give treatment. Uh, the overall, in our hands, the overall risk of these patients is between three and five percent uh, to deteriorate. So I believe that uh, the possible harms coming from the drug are higher than the harm which are coming from the infection per se. And uh, we jumped into this discussion. Uh, with uh, the European authorities, whether we should deliver or not treatment to patients with low SUPAR. And the end result was that probably we had to avoid that patient population. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued uh, by an, another finding of your uh, data. Uh, and I saw that uh, you showed an increase of dams into the gut and into the lung. There were any clues or any data concerning the change of the microbiome into the gut and into the lung consequent to the inflammation? Well, thank you very much for this. Uh, to be honest in this model, we have kept all the samples, but you understand that when it came to shift all our operation towards the approval by the regulatories, I mean, we were fully absorbed by that. <laughs> so uh, this is something which is pending. Thank you very much indeed. We have to move on for the sake of time. Thank you again, Evangelos. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to invite to the podium the following speaker, who is Edward Schrenk uh, from the New York Presbyterian Cornell Medical College. And uh, I would say that the title of his presentation is a bit worrisome. Neuroinflammatory <laughs> cell death in sepsis. Right. Sepsis is very common. Looking at the death of our neurological system <laughs> oh, yeah, would no, be a tragedy. Uh, well, well, I hope to shed some light on uh, what I mean by this terminology, as it's not familiar, obviously, with uh, very, very many people in, in the group. So thank you very much um, for inviting me. Thank you to the chairs. Um, I, ne necroinflammatory cell death is a terminology that hopefully by the end of the talk you guys will, will understand. And so I have no relevant conflicts of uh, interest. So let's start with a little tale. The Red Queen tells Alice, now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And so this is the Red Queen hypothesis, which um, since the early 1970s by Van Valen has been an approach to consider eukaryotic cellular um, evolution and how constant pressure from pathogens um, in the evolutionary balance creates an arms race in which you know, eukaryotic organisms um, will evolve one mechanism to deal with the pathogen's response, but at the same time, the pathogens develop other mechanisms in order to deal with um, the eukaryotic um, method to halt the pathogen. And so let's keep this in mind as we're going along. Next, let's go uh, back to the early 20th century. So this is one of my favorite writers from um, Lewis Thomas, was the chair of medicine at NYU and wrote editorials in the New England Journal of Medicine during the 1970s. And this is a look back at the pre-antibiotic era, um, at the natural history of lobar pneumonia during this time was most likely pneumococcus. And the prose is beautiful, so I'll read it. The, you know, lobar pneumonia is defined by the sudden onset of chills and fever and cough, sometimes with blood tinged sputum and pain in the side of the chest. It's an acute illness lasting 10 to 14 days with a high fever each day, exhaustion, and debilitation. 
And suddenly and triumphantly as the bright sunshine after a thunderstorm, one of the greatest phenomena of human disease, the crisis, the patient's temperature would drop from 106 degrees, so this is you know, 41 degrees centigrade, to normal. And at the same time, with a good deal of sweating, the patient would announce that they felt better and would like something to eat. And the illness would end just like that. So the reason I bring up these two stories is it gets back to the idea that there is more than just the innate immune system when we are considering the, um, the host response to sepsis. And what necroinflammatory cell death hopes to get at is the interplay between the innate and adaptive immunity. And so if you go back to the way that the innate immune system um, interacts with the adaptive immune system, you can go back to the idea that Evangelis brought up earlier is that in order to maximally stimulate T cell production and B cell and antibody production, is that it took more than just the antigen um, presented by the pathogen. And that immune activation, this is Janeway's work going back 50 years almost now, it requires co-stimulation. And co-stimulation um, can involve many different types of molecules. I have them all scattered throughout here. And that, with co-stimulation, you get the expansion of the adaptive immune response and the coordination of the innate immune response. So you have polymorphic nuclear cells and um, uh, T cell activation. The same thing actually can happen, or, or so, and what we have kind of, the terminology thrown around by this is this idea of pathogen-associated molecular patterns like LPS or peptidoglycan or lipotechoic acid or bacterial RNA. And the same sorts of um, signaling as Evangelis also discussed, can occur within um, breakdown of, or necrosis of the human body after an ischemic insult or trauma. And these are, are known colloquially as damps or damage associated molecular patterns, and they are intracellular bacterial um, or intracellular content that resembles um, bacteria in many ways or, or activates pattern recognition receptors in the same strategy um, that um, PAMPs do. And it has been known, you know, for about 25 years now, that immune cell apoptosis in response to cellular stressors is a key um, kind of, I'm searching for the right word here, it's, it's a key um, branch point in the immune response. And, you know, if you look back at some of the early studies of lymphocyte cell death and sepsis, you can see these, these um, pictures are a little bit too small, I apologize, but you can see that in a CLP model, this is work by um, Richard Hotchkiss, um, who was the leader um, in this field at the time, that you can see that there was much higher levels of um, different types of thymocytes, splenocytes, um, with differing um, insults with CLP, and that the caspase inhibitor ZVAD um, abrogated this response at um, increasing doses. And then in terms of uh, survival model, um, ZVADs are the caspase inhibitor, and caspases are, are of course, the effector molecules of uh, apoptosis. That um, ZVAD in, in had a dose and temporal um, relationship to improving survival. So if you see the low-dose ZVAD actually completely abrogated um, sur um, mortality in this model here. As you increase the dose at an early time point, you get a little bit worsened outcome. And if you increase the dose further, the outcome resembles placebo. And if you delay the dose, that the outcome is worse. And it was thought that apoptosis was the only game in town in terms of the program cell death, and that although um, you know, the histology um, demonstrated necrosis from lots of, uh, in lots of different tissues in septic patients, for example, this was thought to be due to loss of ATP or, or loss of um, plasma membrane um, um, integrity. Um, but it was not thought to be that it was um, a natural cellular process, but we know more now. And so a few years later, if you, if you um, from these two papers that were published almost simultaneously in Cell and Science, the um, two labs have discovered that there is caspase-independent cell death. And so caspase-independent cell death is, um, had a necrotic appearance and the release of intracellular con content, and mo mainly this was in response to caspase in inhibition. In the, um, executors of these types of cell death were um, described as the RIP, or RIP kinases. Um, and there was, it, although the mechanism was not worked out yet at this time. And if you fast forward uh, 10 more years since then, 
as Evangelist mentioned in one of his slides as well, is that even the RIP kinase related um, program cell death is not alone. And that in addition to caspase mediated cell death or apoptosis, um, there is necroptosis, as it is called, which further affector molecules of MLKL, which I'll get a little bit more detail to later, and even new newer um, molecules, NINJ1 is, is the effector mechanism for other sorts of membrane cleavage um, in, this, in this paradigm. And that there's also inflammasome-mediated program cell death, or pyroptosis, which is um, carried out through inflammasome activation and, and gas dermin um, related permeability changes within the cell wall. And there are even more than that. There's netosis and parthanatosis and ferroptosis. And so let's walk through what this would look like in the setting of differing responses. And so evolutionarily, um, but also depending on situations that happen now, you have a, a pathogen that has an intracellular niche and there's an inflammatory signal that um, bonds, binds to its canonical um, um, binding domain here. And in response, it's beneficial for the cell to off itself, to kill itself in order to re remove the intracellular niche in response to the inflammatory in insult. And so apoptosis is actually beneficial for the host in this regard. Um, and so many pathogens actually can inhibit apoptosis. And so in response to the same signaling and some other, and some other ones, the same um, death receptors are able to activate the necrosome, um, which does not go through a caspase dependent pathway, but instead it gets either shunted over towards an, a, um, a necroptosis pathway, which opens pores um, in the cell, cellular membrane, which allows for the release of damps during the cell death process. And even more so, there are other inhibitors of both necroptosis and apoptosis. So this is a, a simplified schema, but in this response as well, you can have inflammasome activation from binding to the same receptors and, and activation of IL-1 beta and IL-18, which goes through a gas germin um, um, mediated mechanism of change in the, in the cellular permeability. All right, so, so clinical data, for, we've been studying um, these necroptosis and pyroptotic um, kind of biomarkers in the plasma for the past you know, five years. And this is a paper that um, uh, we, we published in the uh, JCI Insight um, in 2018 across a cohort um, spanning two continents in North America and Asia that we, in, in about 1,000 patients in the ICU on day one. We see a, lo a log linear relationship between the upfront severity of illness and the degree of, of the RIP kinase um, that's detectable in the plasma. And also, one of the, surprisingly, one of the activators of apoptosis versus um, necroptosis, we see an inverse relationship in a multi-cohort study um, related to the severity of illness and also related to outcomes. And that potentially it speaks to the feedback loops um, that are involved in these mechanisms. And more recently, with some un unpublished data, we've, we, we show that gastermin um, D in, in plasma samples is positive related to, to SOFA. And it's also related to other markers of pyroptosis activity in the ICU. And is a pretty decent um, predictor of death in that same um, population. And putting this all together, um, we see that necroinflammatory biomarkers, so necroinflammatory is the combination of all of these biomarkers together. Um, and we see that the biomarkers themselves cluster together and that patients um, cluster differentially. Oops cluster differentially as they relate to um, the relative uh, contribution of these biomarkers. And these clusters actually um, are related to baseline uh, severity of illness, baseline risk of death, and outcomes. And so the interplay between cell death programs is critical. This is a fantastic uh, paper from Cell uh, recently where the, in terms of re responding to TNF-alpha and interferon gamma um, insults combined, requires the coordinated response of both inhibiting apoptosis mechanisms through um, caspase um, knockout, and additionally, RIP kinase um, um, mechanisms through uh, the, the, the dual knockout in terms of um, uh, getting rid of the effect of, of the dual stimulation. And so as a kind of, as a 
in a theoretical model, you can have your pathogen insults leading to apoptosis or necroptosis or a combination of those two things together in, um, in the setting of, a, of, a, of an insult. And those things can be seen in the plasma, such as with elevated levels of RIPK3 or with elevated levels of, of damps um, that in, in response to these stimulations. And these damps, in turn, further drive activation of other types of um, necroptotic or um, competing cell death mechanisms in organ tissues, which can, in a, in a feedback loop, um, uh, further influence uh, the dysregulated host response. And now there, there are actually, this is a cartoon I stole from that same uh, cell paper, there are actually several mechanisms in which you can inhibit these pathways. We could inhibit at the stimulating level from um, stopping TNF or interferon. And JAK-STAT um, um, works along um, the, the pathways that lead to necrosome activation. And there are actually several um, RIP kinase inhibitors as well. And there are gas and MLKL inhibitors that are on the um, pathway. The other terminology for necroinflammatory cell death <laughs> is panoptosis. So that's the combination of pyroptosis, apoptosis, and necroptosis together. I prefer the term necroinflammatory, but there is disagreement in the, um, in the community. All right, so in closure, cellular fate is critical for determining the immune response, but I would say that the, we should be cautious if we're considering um, intervening along these pathways because, the, because of the degree of crosstalk and because of the coincident um, existence of the multiple um, programs that are at play in the same patient. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions from the audience, please? Uh, Professor Marshall. Yeah, beautiful talk. Um, this, yeah, oh, sorry, thanks so much. this field just keeps getting more and more complex uh, because uh, uh, there are um, it, uh, caspases seem to have actually dual roles. They seem to be capable of both inducing death and inducing cell activation. And whether they do that depends an awful lot on what they interact with, uh, what you know, adapter molecules and what other molecules they form complexes with. So I'm curious in your schemata here, what cells are those? Because neutrophils seem to behave, to behave completely differently. They don't have RIP3 kinase, uh, and you get often very different results, including you know, the, the resolution of inflammation in neutrophil is apoptotic. Uh, so more explanation is needed. You know, uh, some of my colleagues at, at my institution are, are doing endothelial-specific knockout or they're doing macrophage-specific knockouts um, of, of rip, rip kinases, and we do see different results. It, depending on the tissue, yeah. which tissue, which cells are you talking about? Are you talking neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes? Uh... Monocytes and even endothelial cells. So okay. non-professional yeah. immune cells okay. are yeah. involved okay. um, as well. So the, the cell matters. Yeah. Thanks. There is another question there from I, Professor Jamarello. I was wondering, based on your presentation, whether when we measure nets in the circulation, what we actually measure is this process and it seems that this process is completely independent than the original uh, infection trigger. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Uh, it may be that neutro neutrophils carry a special role um, in, in terms of coordinating the immune, uh, the immune response because net netosis is different than pyroptosis, um, um, we think, because it's under different um, control. Now, Net netosis is probably more involved in a lot of sepsis than we per previously had, had thought, so it's probably a, a critical um, pathway. Um, and I would only guess in terms of uh, how they, whether it's directly influenced by the other um, cell death pathways. All right. I have a short question, Edward. Um, in what way is it uh, pathogen dependent if uh, either necroptosis or apoptosis happen? Um, so it's whether the pathogen is intracellular um, or whether there is a presence of a, of a toxin is the way I, I like to think about. Toxins usually mean towards more uh, necroptotic uh, cell death and intracellular pathogens that are not able to inhibit apoptosis will lead to a predominantly a apoptotic cell death. However, if you look at Staph aureus as an example, when you have Staph aureus that's toxin producing um, in, in animal models, if you inhibit um, necroptosis, then you do better. 
Whereas if you have staph aureus, that's causing direct cellular injury and invasion. And so depending on the, um, your infection model, you can get a dis different re result. Great. Thank Speaking you. Speaking to the complexity. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now we move on. Um, and a very prominent speaker, John Marshall, um, will talk about endotoxin has a hormone-like effect. John, we're looking forward to your talk. Well, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to take a, perhaps a slightly provocative uh, a stance on this and argue that endotoxin, as it has evolved in uh, association with multicellular organisms, has a role that is at least as important as a hormone or pro-hormone in activating the inflammatory response. So this is the uh, molecule I'm talking about, uh, endotoxin, also known as lipo lipopolysaccharide. It is a component of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, uh, and it consists, uh, as you can see in the schematic, of a core glycolipid, a, uh, a lipid A component that gives it its uh, toxicity, and then this long uh, O side chain, which gives uh, specificity to different strains of bacteria. So it is a substance that is ubiquitous in nature. It's found uh, in gram-negative bacteria, and as a result, uh, it's found in huge quantities in the gastrointestinal tract. It's estimated that there's something like uh, 25 grams of endotoxin in the GI tract. And if you translate that into the amount of endotoxin that's required to make somebody sick, it was actually uh, suggested that you could kill six million people with the endotoxin that's present in the GI tract of every one of us in this particular room. So it's, it's quite potent. It's also found ubiquitously in nature. Part of the high that people get when they smoke is that they're inhaling endotoxin because tobacco leaves uh, harbor uh, gram-negative bacteria and uh, that endotoxin in the cell wall is released uh, when the tobacco is burned. So given that it is everywhere in nature, and it has been for an awful long time, it's not surprising that we've developed a really quite complex relationship uh, to uh, endotoxin. At the same time, we've tended to think of this as being a convenient shorthand for sepsis. And so going back to work in the 1980s when you know, TNF was first identified and interleukin-1, interleukin-10, the models tended to be models where you would inject endotoxin into a small animal, usually a mouse, uh, and then look at what happened if you manipulated the particular mediated, mediator that you were targeting. And lo and behold, you could do that and you could save uh, mice from well over now 200 different uh, uh, mediators. You could modify their activity uh, by, modify the activity of endotoxin by modifying the uh, activity of that uh, mediator. Unfortunately, uh, none of that led to uh, therapies in human beings. And so it raises the question, just what is the relationship of endotoxin, this ubiquitous molecule, to illness, uh, or, and particularly the illness associated with sepsis? And at the outset, it's first important to say that you can replicate the murine model of endotoxemia in a human. This was a case report published in uh, the New England Journal uh, in the 1990s of a lab worker in a lab where they were doing human endotoxin challenge who uh, was depressed, decided that it was time to end it all, and injected himself with uh, endotoxin. And he developed a syndrome which was indistinguishable from what we see as sepsis. As you can see, he became febrile, uh, tachycardic, hypotensive, uh, required fluids. Uh, this was quite a while ago, so he was given dopamine at a dose of uh, five micrograms per kilogram uh, per liter. But a classical picture that we would think of, and this is with a single dose of endotoxin, no viable bacteria, simply this uh, toxic bacterial product. So by that, uh, uh, criterion, it's hard to argue that endotoxin isn't a toxin. Here's the definition of toxin from the Oxford English Dictionary. It's a poisonous substance, especially one that's produced by bacteria in plants and animals. And I think you'd agree that that fits uh, lipopolysaccharide uh, to a T. It clearly is a toxin, uh, and particularly when you get exposed to too much of it. But what about the idea of 
it having other activities. And so if you think of what a hormone is, here is the OED uh, definition of a hormone. It's a chemical substance produced in the body or in a plant that encourages growth or influences how cells and tissues function. So it has many of the similar features uh, that were ascribed to a toxin on that previous slide. And maybe the issue here is not so much a fundamental biochemical difference between these classes of compounds, but maybe it's a dose uh, uh, issue, and maybe it's how uh, they interact with the cell. And I think if you look at what's happened with endotoxin, it has a lot of the hallmarks of a hormone rather than a toxin. So just to simplify a complex process, when endotoxin is present in the blood, it results from the lysis of gram-negative bacteria. Free endotoxin is released, uh, and for it to be transported, it actually has a dedicated carrier protein, lipopolysaccharide binding protein, that it binds specifically to. LBP then transfers that bound endotoxin to another cell surface molecules, uh, CD14, and uh, the, there's a very uh, uh, close relationship between those two. LBP, the endotoxin has to interact with CD14. It then in turn uh, interacts with toll-like receptor 4 and the accessory protein MD2, and all of that has to happen. But when that happens, it doesn't kill the cell, the cell responds. It allows the cell to evoke a very complex kind of response. And that response actually leads to the differential expression of close to 4,000 different genes. So to me, this is not the signature of a toxin. This is a signature that you would anticipate with an endogenous substance reacting with its conserved signaling uh, mechanisms uh, inside a cell to evoke a response which, of course, uh, didn't evolve as a suicide mechanism, but evolved to protect us uh, against uh, infection. So let's just think about this, whether en uh, endotoxin is a hormone or a toxin. If you think of a hormones, hormones are generally endogenous, uh, whereas toxins are exogenous. Hormones often have a releasing hormone, um, LHRH, for example, a toxin we don't normally think of having a releasing hormone. Hormones may have a carrier protein that carries them in the blood so that they uh, arrive intact at their cell targets. They have a dedicated receptor that is activated by an interaction with the hormone. They may have a counter hormone uh, that modifies that particular effect. But probably the most important thing is that a hormone evokes a cellular response, whereas a toxin uh, causes an injury to the cell, a direct injury to the cell. And so when you do that, there's a lot more of the features of endotoxin that end up on the hormone side of the equation than on the toxin side. One can argue that uh, endotoxins is endogenous because we all carry it. That's not because we didn't wash our hands, that's because we have evolved to require uh, uh, a flora in, on our uh, epithelial surfaces, and that's part of a healthy existence. It doesn't seem to have a releasing hormone, although one could argue that endotoxin itself is the releasing hormone for the complex series of hormonal responses that occur uh, through cytokines. It has a dedicated carrier protein, LBP. It's got a dedicated receptor, the TLR4-MDT uh, complex. Even has a counter hormone. Uh, bactericidal permeability increasing protein uh, is a neutrophil product that can specifically neutralize uh, endotoxin and has been used therapeutically. And again, most importantly, uh, it evokes a cellular response. So this is kind of not just idle sophistry, because the way we think about endotoxin really does influence how we would respond to an excess of endotoxin. A hormone can cause disease when you either have too much of it or too little of it. And there's no question when you have too much uh, endotoxin, uh, it is injurious. But it raises the alternate hypothesis that perhaps when you have too little of it, uh, it is also uh, detrimental. A toxin, on the other hand, presumably there's a dose-response relationship that is optimized when the dose is uh, zero. So a lot of what we know about endotoxin comes from uh, this uh, uh, 
experiment of nature where a colony of mice uh, back in the 1960s developed a spontaneous mutation that meant that they were no longer sensitive to uh, endotoxin when you injected it into them. And it quickly became apparent that what had happened was the animals had a point mutation in a gene uh, and the identification of that gene uh, was only accomplished in 1998. Uh, it won Bruce Boitler the Nobel Prize in Medicine uh, for describing TLR4. Uh, and what he showed is that at, at uh, 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 amino acid 712, there was a P to H uh, mutation that rendered those uh, mice uh, non-responsive to endotoxin. So we've got an animal here that can't respond to endotoxin. What happens when it gets infected? Well, um, it's complicated, but one of the things that happens is it's less capable of clearing uh, a second infection. In clearance of candida is impaired in uh, mice that have this mutation in TLR4 that means they can't uh, signal in response to endotoxin. And the neutrophil numbers are reduced at the same time. This is slightly more, uh, slightly less direct, but Endotoxin is part of the normal uh, components of the uh, GI flora, and you can raise mice in an endotoxin-free manner, a germ-free manner. When you do that, those mice are incredibly resistant to endotoxin, but very, very susceptible to lethality with uh, infection with common organisms like uh, Klebsiella or uh, Staph aureus. So again, in the animal literature, there's some suggestion that being able to respond to endotoxin has uh, an adaptive value. Um, and it underlines the fact that endotoxin can evoke different kinds of some consequences depending on what the challenge is. In, in gram-positive uh, infections, uh, neutralization of TNF, which in turn is induced by endotoxin, is detrimental, whereas in gram-negative infections, it is uh, uh, potentially beneficial. Um, so let's look at ad some admittedly uh, weak uh, suggestion that this might actually be happening in some patients, and that this may be one other source of heterogeneity in the host response in critical illness. This was a clinical trial, the ACCESS trial of Aritaran, which was a endotoxin-like molecule that bound to TLR4 but didn't activate the cell. And the idea here is that it's a, um, a TLR4 antagonist or an endotoxin inhibitor. It was used in a cohort of septic patients, a uh, very heterogeneous cohort, and there was no signal whatsoever for any benefit uh, for uh, blocking the response to antitoxin. But if you look at that subgroup of patients that had gram-positive infections, there was actually a statistically significant increase in mortality in those patients who received the TLR4 antagonist. Subgroup effect, small effect, and I agree with all of that. But to me, it's a signal there that should uh, perhaps raise a question, because we've seen this before. The uh, original study of one of the first antibodies to endotoxin, HA1A, uh, showed uh, some real benefit for neutralizing endotoxin in vivo. The authors had to conduct a follow-up study, uh, which they did in over 2,000 patients, more pragmatic kind of design. The effect that had been seen in the earlier trial was no longer there. But again, there was a trend that in those patients with gram-positive infection, uh, the outcome was worse if you treated them with an antibody to endotoxin. So it's not enough to, to draw any more conclusions, but I, did, I think it is one of those other cautions that needs to be kind of incorporated into the lexicon when we think about heterogeneity in critical illness. And there's biologic plausibility for this. Strenuous exercise induces endotoxemia because it induces changes in gut permeability and absorption of endotoxin from the GI tract. So perhaps this is part of the evolutionarily conserved adaptive response as we have the flight or fight response uh, that allows the body to rev up uh, its response to an acute uh, threat. And additionally, uh, endotoxin is not specific for uh, infection, but it can also occur in a variety of, of disease states where gut permeability is altered. Uh, excuse me, from uh, chronic renal failure and uh, cardiogenic shock through to multiple trauma. Uh, 
So I just want to leave you with the concept here that I think because, just because we call lipopolysaccharide endotoxin doesn't mean that that's its only role in uh, uh, patients with complex infections. It seems to potentially have a role as a stress hormone or a releasing hormone that uh, activates an inflammatory response and therefore supports the, some of the beneficial components of that response. So it's possible that disease may result from either excess or inadequate activity, and that ultimately what we may decide that our goal uh, is not so much to neutralize endotoxin as to optimize its m levels for a particular patient in a particular uh, stressful situation. And with that, I'll stop. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, John. Very interesting. Uh, are there any questions? Tom. <clears throat> this is really fascinating talk, uh, John. It's a totally different concept of thinking about endotoxin. The only thing is that we, we may need to call it differently. In my perspective, an, an hormone is produced by the body and it's tightly regulated. Yeah. Uh, correct. Um, and, and in fact, both endotoxin meets both those criteria. Uh, if you consider the body to include its endogenous flora, the endogenous gram-negative flora of the uh, body, and particularly the aerobic flora, which is probably where the most active endotoxin comes from, is quite tightly regulated by the anaerobic flora of the GI tract. So it, it, it means seeing the body as a little bit more than just the mammalian cells. It means seeing it as being the whole microbiome associated with the body. But there is a level of potential regulation there. I see the parallel, but it's, it's like, like insulin or thyroid hormone. They, the response of these hormones is so immediate to uh, changing blood glucose levels, for example, mm -hmm. um, which is different, I guess, from endotoxin, which is more responsive to, to injurious. So in my jet-lagged state last night as I was thinking about this, it struck me that this concept that it's a hormone is probably uh, not as good as the concept that it's a releasing hormone, and that maybe we could think of it as a trigger for uh, the... Um, uh, you know, toll-like receptor uh, uh, mediated inflammatory response, which has beneficial as well as maladaptive consequences associated with it. And that might be better than thinking of it as a hormone. Now, John, following your line of thought, um, you, would you agree that there is a phenomenon called um, endotoxin tolerance in sepsis patients? Yes. Absolutely. And how would you rate this in, uh, in, in your new way of thinking about endotoxin? Um, it's a good question. It's a good question, and I'm not sure I could give you a, an erudite answer on my feet. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ponder it. I, endoto I mean, I have trouble with endotoxin tolerance because what it is, I'm not actually, I certainly know that the phenomenon is described. It's described quite differently by different people who study mm -hmm. it, and so I'm not quite sure what it is uh, that we're talking about, and therefore it puts, makes it difficult to put it into a paradigm. Maybe we can discuss this later with Tom van der Poel. <laughs> Maybe, but uh, is it the reason now of this new interpretation uh, that may explain why so we had so many failures in the various uh, uh, attempt we made from removing the endotoxin or antagonizing yeah. it? I, it's entirely possible. I mean, and it's it, because it's equally striking that there was the initial um, trials of uh, anti-endotoxin therapies were really quite impressive. Uh, Ziegler's trials, both with the polyclonal antibody and with HA1A, but it, it was a different population of patients. Those were patients with gram with you know circulating endotoxemia, gram-negative bacteremia, and it may well be in a you know our conventional sepsis populations right now include a fair number of people with community-acquired pneumonia, which is typically pneumococcal pneumonia. And so it may well be one of the things that is explained why we haven't done as well. I, if the data, to me, from the access yeah. trial really do raise that, that potential caution. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Let's move on. Uh, I invite at the podium the following speaker, who is Tom van der Poel from the University of Amsterdam and is going to present the host response aberration in ICU acquired pneumonia. Thank you very much. Um, 
so let's first define a little bit of the problem. So I see quite pneumonia, I see quite infections. <coughs> let, let me show you how often uh, I see quite pneumonia and I see quite infections occur um, and when approximately uh, after admission to the ICU. So by definition, an ICU quiet infection is a new infection that occurs more than 48 hours after the admission uh, to the uh, ICU. This is data from the Netherlands, so it may not be applicable to uh, the rest of the world, but this is the data that we generated ourselves a couple of years ago in the intensive care units of Amsterdam and the University Medical Center of Utrecht. Um, from the Mars cohort, we split out uh, sepsis admissions and non-sepsis admissions, and the frequency of ICU-acquired infections was 13.3% in the sepsis admission group and 15.1% in the, uh, the non-SEPS admission group. Here are time frames and the proportion of patients that in this time frame uh, had a ICU-acquired infection. And if you look then at the source of infection in these patients, it pops up that the lung uh, is the most prominent cause, uh, a source of the infection in regards to ICU-acquired infections, which is in particular true for the non-SEPS admissions but also for the sepsis admission, lung is a very important source of an infection that you can inquire in the ICU. Um, let's then shift to the host response. And this is um, a diagrammatic representation of what we currently believe is the host response to sepsis, but you might also say the host response to critical illness in general. Um, so this is the top here are inflammatory responses, pro-inflammatory responses, which relate to leukocyte activation, endothelial cell activation, coagulation activation, complement activation, and activation of platelets. And down below here in green, there's anti-inflammatory responses that may result in immune suppression, which mainly relate to apoptosis of T cells and B cells, and also reprogramming of antigen-presenting cells. Now, what we believe now is that once you enter the ICU, you're sick enough to become admitted to the ICU, there's evidence of both um, arms of this dysregulated immune response uh, relating to different organ systems, different cell types. Um, and in the, uh, in the literature, is then dominated by the fact that the anti-inflammatory immune suppressive reactions are responsible for the late deaths in patients on the ICU and also for the occurrence of ICU-acquired infections. Now, this is based on abundant literature and uh, people have been looking for biomarkers of immune suppression in the critically ill in general, but in particular in sepsis. And this is a non-complete list of those biomarkers of immune suppression. Lymphopenia is very easy to measure. Monocyte HLADR or MHC class 2 expression on, on blood monocytes, reduced expression thereof is a sign of immune suppression and also reduced capacity of blood leukocytes to produce cytokines upon re-stimulation, and a few other markers that may be uh, more recent. Now, there's been extensive literature in particular about monocyte HLA-DR expression, and this is just a recent example from the, from the group of Fabienne Fenet uh, and uh, Guillaume Mon Monare from France, uh, where they looked at monocyte HLA-DR expression by flow cytometry, um, and they, they look then at day one, two after ICU admission, day three, four, and day six, eight. And you might appreciate that later on in the course during ICU stay, so day six, day eight, the reduced uh, monocyte HLR dispersion correlates with uh, mortality, so lower in non-survivors, and also lower in the patients who go on to develop a secondary infection. There's multiple studies, and in particular from this group, who did excellent work on this. Uh, this is a, a, a partially overlapping cohort, differently analyzed, um, where they stratified patients at day 5 sef to 7 based on their monocyte HLADR expression in four different strata. And the top stratum here is the one with the lowest monocyte HLADR expression, and these have uh, the highest occurrence of secondary infection. Now, there's multiple studies and there's not enough time um, that indicate that um, expression of biomarkers of immune suppression relates to the subsequent development of secondary infection. Not all of these biomarkers correlate with secondary infection. Most of them, however, do correlate with mortality. 
Now the question that I would like to pose here uh, and to challenge a little bit this, this paradigm, this dogma that immune suppression biomarkers are uh, predictive of secondary infection and the suggestion of causality here, is what about pro-inflammatory immune responses if you start looking at those in patients who later on develop a secondary infection. Now this is a relatively old study published now six years ago in the Blue Journal um, where we looked in the MARS cohort at patients uh, with sepsis admitted to the ICU who later on developed an ICU-acquired infection, at median day nine was that, um, and we measured cytokines and a bunch of other biomarkers uh, during the first four days of ICU admission, so prior to ICU-acquired uh, infections. And sure enough, the patients that went on to develop an ICU-acquired infection had exaggerated cytokine uh, responses in, in red versus the patients who did not develop an ICU-acquired infection in blue. And this was not only true for the cytokine response, but also for a bunch of other um, inflammatory responses and this is endothelial cell barrier function. Now, you cannot say that this is an immune suppressive reaction, right? This is a typical pro-inflammatory reaction where the endothelial barrier is disturbed. And this was more disturbed in the patients who later on developed an ICU-acquired infection. So this is against the dogma that immune suppression is totally responsible for secondary infection. Now, this is a study that's yet unpublished and it's in review which is a big uh, study uh, <coughs> done across um, uh, 30 hospitals in 11 European countries as part of the COMBACT consortium, um, where uh, in the ASPIRE ICU studies, 2,000 patients were enrolled who were uh, critically ill patients with an expected ICU stay of more than 48 hours, and they had to be on mechanical ventilation. And um, in these patients, we looked at those patients who went on to develop an ICU-acquired pneumonia, so more than 48 hours after the admission, and, uh, and the controls, those who did not. So it's a fairly large study. So what we did here, and this was done by Chitske van Engelen, uh, with a large group of other investigators, uh, we had many controls because the occurrence of pneumonia was 15.8% in this cohort, ICU-acquired pneumonia, and the controls who did not develop pneumonia were 842 so uh, this was not doable in measuring a whole bunch of um, uh, biomarkers. So we, we uh, met, or we, we did a random uh, drawing. We matched one to two uh, controls to pneumonia cases, and we um, did not use these non-selected controls. And obviously, we did a comparison. The non-selected controls were totally comparable to the controls that were selected for the biomarker analysis. So we obtained plasma samples of enrollment in the study, which was a day two medium after ICU admission. Uh, we we draw, drew blood at the day of the event in the patients that developed pneumonia, and patients that did not develop a pneumonia, we drew blood at day seven. And then we <coughs> measured biomarkers, in total 19, uh, and we stratified them according to pathophysiological domains, cytokine release, systemic inflammation, endothelial cell and procoagulant responses. Now these are all mainly almost exclusively pro-inflammatory responses, you have to take into account that measuring immune suppressive biomarkers in plasma is not an easy thing to do because there are not many immune suppressive biomarkers that you can measure in plasma. Okay, these are um, the objectives of the study. So we wish to establish whether um, these host response uh, biomarkers were different prior to the development of pneumonia. Um, at the time of pneumonia and also the trajectory from baseline to the day of event, whether this was different in cases versus controls. So these are the, the, the table, the better table one, uh, with baseline data and outcome data, and I just selection obviously because otherwise it's not readable. Uh, age and gender were comparable. Uh, these are the reasons for ICU admission, so it, it's a mixed bag, it, it's, it's all comers to the ICU. Uh, not statistically significant difference between cases and control, and the patients who developed the pneumonia, so the cases had a longer ICU stay, not unexpected, and also uh, not so a, a worse outcome with regards to mortality, also not unexpected. Now, these are the biomarker data, and uh, in red are always the cases, in blue are always the controls. Um, this is baseline, and this is the day of the event. Um, and you can see here the cytokine levels, IL-6, IL-8, IL-10, IL-1-RA, and these are other markers of systemic inflammation. 
And sure enough, both at baseline, at, at baseline and the day of the event, all of these markers were higher in the, basis, uh, in the cases, so in the patients who later on developed a, an ICU acquired pneumonia that is at baseline, but also at the day of the event, these markers were more uh, disturbed. And here you see the interaction term, so if this is significant and is listed here, then also the slope of the biomarker from baseline to event is different between the groups. We also measured endothelial cell and coagulation activation marker, uh, and here's the same story. Um, so all of these markers are more disturbed already at baseline, so prior to the develop of pneumonia, and at the day of pneumonia, they remain more disturbed than the cases. So the first conclusion of this, this, this study is that critically ill patients who develop pneumonia while in the ICU have a more disturbed host response in general. Uh, so we didn't do cellular analysis, it's not doable in such a huge cohort across uh, 30 different hospitals. Um, but, but across several pathophysiological domains, all of these domains were disturbed, more disturbed in patients prior to development of ICU-acquired pneumonia. Then another question you might uh, ask to yourself, what about other lung disorders? So if you would think that ICU-acquired pneumonia is a sign of immune suppression, what about ICU-acquired ARDS? You can, you can hardly say that this is a sign of immune suppression. This would be a sign of pro-inflammation, rather. So we went back to the MARS cohort, and this is still work in progress. So in the MARS cohort, um, every diagnosis is very well annotated. So we selected the patients that did not have pneumonia and not have ARDS on admission to the ICU. Then we looked at ICU-acquired pneumonia and ICU-acquired ARDS. And then we started collecting the samples prior to the day of diagnosis. Now, I don't have this data here for you to share because it's too complica complicated. We didn't do the analysis yet. So I restricted myself here to the day of the event. So these are the patients in blue with uh, ICU-acquired ARDS, ICU-acquired pneumonia, and these are patients that did not have an ARDS or pneumonia. And we measured, again, a whole bunch of biomarkers. And the take-home message of this study is, which was done by Tom Reinders, is that ARDS acquired on the ICU and pneumonia acquired on the ICU have roughly similar biomarker profiles. There's no difference. And we selected patients in which the ARDS patients did not have pneumonia, right? So it's, it's like we try to make it as pure as possible. Um, and the fact that uh, patients that control patients are lower is actually in concordance with what I just showed about the Aspire ICU study. We also looked at endothelial cell and coagulation responses, and a similar picture emerged. So ICU acquired ARDS and ICU acquired pneumonia, similar biomarker profiles, roughly, um, and they're both different from the ICU controls. Work in progress because we have sequential samples of these patients prior to the day of event, which um, Initial analysis shows that there's not much difference between the trajectory towards ARDS versus the trajectory towards pneumonia on the ICU. Final slide, what I've tried to show you is that patients who develop a pneumonia while on the ICU have a disturbed host response that is true for multiple pathophysiological pathways, and it's not only true for immune suppressive markers. So if you only look at immune suppressive markers, you will find the association. But if you also look at pro-inflammatory markers, you will find similar associations. So this disturbance that you see are both pro-inflammatory immune suppressive. And all of these studies are associative studies. So we don't know what's causing this. But I would like to argue that it's not the truth that immune suppression is the cause of ICU-acquired infections. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, John Marshall has a question. Yeah, Tom, this is such great work. I, a thought came to mind. The original rationale with uh, selective digestive tract decontamination was that one picked up microbial colonization very early on in the ICU through interventions like uh, intubation. Do you think that might be what you're looking at, a response to some low-level not even necessarily invasive, but bacteria, bacteria in the lungs that got there by uh, in a patient who was being intubated. And, and as a way of testing that, have you looked to see if the responses differ in those patients who at baseline are intubated versus not intubated? 
in the Aspire ICU, all patients were intubated. And, and in, use in, of SDD? Um, that was uh, in Aspire ICU, that's different between hospitals. In Mars, we looked at the influence of STD on mm -hmm. host response parameters. There was no influence. Um, and your first question, I didn't totally get, so... <laughs> well, just wondering if what's... If there, I mean, it, it, it's fascinating that these patients who, you know, we think the problem is the infection they've acquired two or three days later, and that we have to treat that aggressively, but it seems that there's something already going on, uh, you know, long before that ever became manifest. Yeah. So the question is, was there actually, was the process starting and was it an infectious process early on? Or is it a fundamental difference in the patient populations and how they're responding to whatever their insult was? Yeah, my, I, I, I don't know the exact answer to this. So my, my take on this is that uh, ICU acquired infections are mainly related to um, invasive um, therapies like ventilator, catheter, um, and um, I cannot imagine, for example, why a catheter-related bloodstream infection would be caused by immune suppression. It's, it's the catheter that's yeah. contaminated. Yeah, exactly. and, and it's, I mean, you can have a local mm -hmm. immune response that may be less, yeah. but, but still it's the catheter that's causing the infection and, and not a, a, a failing immune response. I think if I would put a catheter in you and, and, uh, and, and I would lie you in a hospital bed, you would also develop, in the end, an ICU acquired infection. So it's more that um, the longer you are in the ICU, the higher the likelihood becomes that you develop um, an ICU acquired infection. And that's more than anything is the risk of, of what we're facing here. And the fact that we see that the immune response is more disturbed in patients who develop an ICU acquired infection. I'm not saying that the pro-inflammatory response is causing the infection. I'm just saying that these patients show a disturbed immune response, which may be the cause that they're longer on the ICU, I don't know. Um, and that's why they develop more ICU acquired infection. Obviously, you need to intervene, but in um, the trials thus far that have been done, the power thereof is not sufficient to look at what happens to secondary infections. Hi, Tony McLean, um, Sydney. Um, what, one of the questions I've got is, uh, is that of the terminology that we use, and I often wonder when we talk about um, hyperstimulation of the immune system or hypostimulation of the immune system, we actually set ourselves a bit of a trap insofar as that we call it anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory depending on what markers that we use. Mm. And I often wonder, you know, you're saying, you're trying to prove, which I think quite well, that, you know, there's a pro-inflammatory pro um, role there, but maybe our problem is we should go back and redefine pro-inflammatory inflammatory or anti-inflammatory or even do away with those terms altogether. It's absolutely true. Um, so th th this terminology is done to make it more graspable or comprehensive. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Actually, when you look at single cells, which we have done, um, in a single cell you see evidence of what we call pro-inflammation and anti-inflammation. If you look at gene expression profiles at single cell level. Um, so this, this whole scheme is so artificial, um, that, uh, but, but it, it makes it understandable, sort of. Uh, we need to start somewhere, but I totally agree with you. It's uh, the terminology thereof. Um, I mean, we, we had Carolyn Kelvin speaking this weekend and also uh, earlier during this conference about the phenotypes that she put on the map, right? The hyperinflammatory and hypoinflammatory ARDS, and she herself says that these terminologies, she doesn't agree with them, but she keeps on using them because everybody's now used to them. Do you have a question? Uh, Tom, beautiful work. I, I, I like the concept. Uh, can you extend uh, that concept to outside the ICU, a pneumonia acquired in the hospital or in the community, and, and test the hypothesis? Yeah, it's... it's um, so, um, what you ideally would like to do is look at patients with, for example, community acquired pneumonia that are admitted to a general ward or maybe presented on the ER, and then you look at their immune response and then you follow them up once they're outside of at home again, because we know that patients that have had a pneumonia in the year thereafter, they develop all kinds of complications, including readmissions for infection. Um, and then you could maybe try to see whether the immune response originally um, uh, correlates in any way with the outcome. Um, so what, what we have done on admission, but not linking with clinical outcome, 
because we have, we have looked at, uh, and that's published, I think, in Frontier Immunology, uh, we looked at something like 40 different biomarkers in patients admitted to the ward with community-acquired pneumonia, and we also looked at their blood leukocyte capacity to produce tumor necrosis factor. Mm. And what you then see is that patients that have the most severely reduced capacity to produce tumor necrosis factor also have the most severely disturbed pro-inflammatory endothelial cell procoagulant uh, mm. responses. Which, which tells me that the severity of illness uh, drives both of these responses. And I don't know if the pro-inflammatory response drives the immune suppressive reactions. That's more likely than the other way around, I would guess. Um, but the, the link has not been proved. Um, you can argue that's probably inflammation comes first uh, at, at the tissue level, and then there's sort of an anti-inflammatory repair reaction. But we don't know what happens prior to patients entering the hospital. Thank you. I have another question. May, may be very clinical. Whatever would be the, the first step, um, do, where possible to identify a threshold at which you may recognize or hypothesize that these patients subsequently may develop pneumonia or RDS? Yeah. Um, has not been done, so there, at least not with biomarks as far as I know. Um, so what has been done extensively is uh, risk factors clinically for, for secondary infections, which mainly relates to how long you have a catheter, how long you yeah. are on the ventilator. Uh, on top of that, biomarkers, as far as I know, has not been done. Um, and you need really sequential data, yes. um, and, and not many people have that. So we could try to look at that in this MARS cohort where we have samples prior to the day of the event, <coughs> daily samples. Um, and uh, that, that, that's an idea to look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful discussion. Um, now the next speaker will be Thierry Kalandra from Lausanne, Switzerland. And um, he will talk about the myeloid-derived suppressor cells as mediators of immunosuppression. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I do not dare anymore after the last 15 minute uh, discussion talking about pro or anti-inflammatory uh, response. We like as human being dichotomic system, pro or against, plus or minus, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, no particular disclosure uh, related to that uh, presentation. So uh, I briefly discuss what are, if we know, uh, myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cells. Uh, I will show data on their elevation in inflammation, infection, and uh, sepsis. I will use uh, endotoxemia mechanically ventilated ICU patients, patients with COVID, and uh, a cord of patients with pneumonia, sepsis, and multi-organ uh, failure syndrome as an example. Uh, and I won't have too much time to go over uh, impact of these cells on cytokine response and a bit on patient's outcome. And I will close by suggesting that this may be indeed biomarker or potentially uh, therapeutic targets uh, in, in sepsis. So thank you, Tom, for the introduction. You dissected <coughs> that slide uh, very well in, in detail. Uh, I, I, I like to teach the students, and we start to accelerate, and we need to break uh, very soon thereafter. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble at the next turn. Uh, so that's exactly what's happening. Initially, we saw it indeed, as Tom uh, beautifully highlighted, that we accelerate first and then we break, but we realize through uh, microarrays that we do that all the time and we continue to do that thereafter. So uh, we have been trying to dissect pro and anti all the time, as I said. So here, one slide to just summarize what this myeloid-derived suppressor cells are. They have been described uh, probably around a century ago. In recent article, they say 30 years, but if you dig backward a bit more, you find already hints that they exist. 
Uh, they are immature myeloid cells that expand, and they have been very well characterized in cancer, uh, but also during chronic and acute inflammatory conditions. And to follow up with the fact that we like to dichotomize things, we recognize that they have immunoregulatory properties. We put them into two categories, PMN, MDCs, and monocytic, MDCs, and they are characterized uh, by FAX studies, by this series of positive or, or negative markers. Uh, and there is perhaps an early subgroups representing less uh, than 5%. According to the name, they have immunosuppressive effects that have been very well characterized. Very few studies have been uh, performed in uh, sepsis, hence uh, our interest. And the work that I'm going to present has been done primarily by Irene uh, Schreifers from the Netherlands uh, with Thierry Roger in the lab. When we try, uh, according to recent review, to figure out how we can characterize by this uh, cell surface marker or intracellular uh, genes, what you see inside the cells, the PMN on the left side and the MMDCs uh, on the right side, are genes that help to characterize one or the other of the two. But up until now, we do not have genes that allow uh, dissection very clearly. So there is an overlap. Uh, between uh, neutrophils and PMN MDCs, likewise monocytes and M MDCs, suggesting that they may transit from one state to another. And there is no indication uh, so far that there is a lineage commitment down the road. Uh, next slide. Uh, we may see their role as either beneficial because as was put by Irene in that uh, review article for her uh, PhD thesis, they produce bactericidal molecule, they counter-regulate inflammatory responses, so they may be beneficial when we accelerate too fast, but it may be also detrimental if we break too hard and Tom made the argument uh, of both pro and anti-inflammatory conditions as paving the way to uh, subsequent infection. So we studied MDCs in various cohort, endotoxin as a pro-inflammatory uh, stimulus, and various cohorts of ICU mechanically ventilated patients, patients with COVID and patients with pneumosepsis, if you like. Uh, wonderful collaboration with uh, Matthijs Cox and uh, Peter Pickers at Radboud University in Nijmegen. Uh, they injected, it happened to be eight males, uh, with uh, endotoxin, and uh, we measured by fax or mass cytometry, site of uh, various cell population and various markers, and the work was done by Irene. So as you can see here, these are site of data. Each dot represents one cell. You basically do not detect MDSCs at baseline, but after four hours, you have here this uh, really uh, dark spot representing PMN as well as MMDCs, and very rapidly goes down almost to uh, baseline within 24 hours. So <laughs> rapid, massive induction of cells and turned off. If you look here into the two population, PMN MDCs and MMDCs, you see that the PMN MDCs follows quite well the increase of neutrophil total number of cell and percentage on the right-hand side. You see here that there is for the MMDCs a bit of dichotomy compared to with the classical pro-inflammatory uh, monocyte CD14 positive, CD16 uh, negative. They tend to follow, but they abruptly decrease where the monocytes stay high uh, at that time. You see it as a relative percentage here as well. So this is endotoxin. 
COVID-19 patients is an example of a pro-inflammatory situation. Uh, exactly the same, PMN and MMDCs, you see a tenfold increase in patients admitted to the hospital for PMN and a fourfold increase uh, for uh, NMDCs. And it goes down by months three. So again, increase and, and, and reduction thereafter. When we did this correlation plot with uh, Luminex assay, we measured uh, around 49 uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And you see when the dot is centered by this black dot, means that there is a statistically significant association between MDC or PMN uh, MDC with this uh, biomarker. So you see that the two uh, are correlated with each other, but the uh, MMDCs are associated with IL-1, IL-7, EGF, hepatocyte growth factor, PDGF, and VGF, uh, whereas PMN seems to be uh, restricted only to EGF and HGF. And this uh, growth factor have been uh, shown to induce, indeed, the expression of MDCs and uh, PMN uh, MDCs. In terms of outcome, we looked at these mechanically ventilated uh, patients in the ICU, small numbers, 32, and what was happening over time in, in the ICU. And you see that in terms of both PMN MDCs and MMDCs, when uh, we uh, separate more than 10% or less than 10% for PMN, less than 1.3% uh, or more than 1.3%, you have the trend. Those who have elevated uh, myeloid-derived cells will uh, die more often than the other ones. Small groups, but statistically uh, significant. Maybe suggesting, as was discussed before, that it's a signature of being really sick and uh, that you may have an excess or either pro or anti-inflammatory responses uh, down the road if you admit that they are immunosuppressive. And this was associated with more infection, but small numbers cannot conclude. But I'm going to highlight that again with this uh, cohort through a Marie Curie grant. Uh, Joost Wiersdinger was the PI on this uh, enterprise, and we had a collaboration between the Netherlands, between Greece and Switzerland. And we could take advantage of a wonderful uh, cohort of 48 ICU, very sick patients with pneumonia, sepsis, multi-organ uh, uh, failure uh, syndrome. And you see that PMN MDCs were associated with secondary infection, new episodes of sepsis after the first one. But we were very troubled by that finding that was not consistent with what we had seen previously. It was the reverse. MMDFCs being elevated uh, was protected for D90 mortality compared to low MDMC's level. So perhaps suggesting that there is a yin and yang component of the cell uh, in, in that system. Before wrapping up, uh, what might be the potential uh, applications of MDSCs in sepsis? Well, you can use them, of course, as biomarker of inflammation or counter regulatory events, immunosuppression with the occurrence of secondary infection ends, as shown on the previous slide, with disease severity and patient outcome. Should we wish to intervene uh, on them as therapeutic targets, we could do that by either blocking recruitment or depleting cells. And this is what is being done right now in oncology uh, patients. We can also inhibit the MDC uh, activities uh, through, in particular, the STAT3 pathway. And uh, we can also uh, induce differentiation to move them uh, forward uh, faster. So these are work uh, hypotheses for future uh, work 
that needs to be tested. So in summary, uh, MDSCs circulate uh, at very low level right now in all of us. They are induced by inflammatory stimuli like endotoxin. They are elevated in critically ill and ICU patients. I have highlighted mechanically ventilated <coughs> patients, COVID, pneumosepsis. Uh, levels at hospital admission are associated with serum biomarkers, impaired cytokine response. Uh, I didn't have time to go uh, over that, but uh, when we stimulated ex vivo with various toll-like receptor ligands, we found that they produce less cytokine, uh, particularly cells uh, of the MDSCs, uh, either PMN or M MDSCs. They may be biomarker for immune activation or suppression. You can take it both ways. And they potentially might be also target for therapeutic in intervention. Would like to highlight the fact that all this work was done by Irene Shriver again with uh, Thierry Roger in the lab, and we could do part of it through uh, uh, Marie Curie grants from the European community, and are very thankful to this uh, agency, particularly as a Swiss being outside of European community, it's always nice to have funds coming. <laughs> this belongs to the past. Hopefully, it will come back again. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for these very interesting data. Are there any comments or questions? Tom. Tom. It's wonderful, uh, Thierry. So, um, mass cytometry allows you to look at signaling events in cells. Have you done this? 40 markers? And no. Uh, the, the sight of machine is fantastic. Uh, it's, it's quite slow process. Uh, and we have uh, only two machines, so uh, Irene had to select what to look at. So th there are tons of samples in the freezer uh, to look at, uh, again, pathways. And this has not been done at, at the level right now uh, sufficient to conclude uh, anything. But obviously, this is a work that we should do. Yeah, you also need computational wisdom. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the prompt appearance of MDACs after um, challenge with endotoxin, you showed very nicely. Do you think this is a protective uh, reaction, evolutionary, or what, 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 what are your ideas about this phenomenon? Could, could, could well be. It's, uh, you know, an alarm signal. And uh, again, this is what I very much like in, in Tom's uh, presentation. Uh, you know, when I reviewed the entire literature with this recent review article, I, I was troubled by the fact that it, it could be a marker initially, uh, and endotoxin shows that, of a pro-inflammatory response, and you induce with that these cells. But I was amazed by the fact that it lasts for only 24 hours, mm. probably related to the spike of endotoxin mm -hmm. and the short course of that event compared to something longer in the ICU. And they probably are transiting hypothesis, so, you know, reprogramming into something that looks like more anti-inflammatory. Mm. I, I still tend to believe from my readings that they are in motion, in transit, and these are not uh, specific cells, lineage-related, coming from the bone marrow. But I may be completely wrong. But the fact that we do not see, you know, typical markers like we would see for other myeloid-derived uh, cells uh, suggests that they, they are indeed transient marker of pro and perhaps anti-inflammatory thereafter. Mm -hmm. Thierry, according to this interpretation, how far we are from a, a potential therapeutic intervention on the early phases? Well, still far away, I guess, <laughs> uh, uh, to, to be uh, careful uh, on that. Um, 
In the cancer field, they, they are trying now to, to manipulate the, the cells. Um, sure. They are, as very often, oncologists are one stage ahead of sepsis research uh, in this area as well. So for the time being, these are just the first suggestion that may be of interest as biomarker or potential targets, but it's very, very early days. Thank you, Dan. Let's move on. It's with pleasure that I invited the podium Anthony McLean from Napier Hospital, Sydney University. And uh, the, the subject of his presentation regards something that in the early 80s was investigated uh, uh, for a long time concerning the involvement of mitochondria in shock. So listening to the novel findings and new interpretation will be really amazing. And the title is the role of mitochondria in the immune response. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we're going back to the 1980s, although with a fresh uh, coat of paint, uh, because there's just so much work avail available information now with the newer techniques we've had over the last 20 years. And uh, it's actually a fact, first of all, I have no conflict of interest. When you look at mitochondria, I guess in the critical care world, we've uh, always been concentrating on the fact that they're a little engine, uh, the uh, engine house of the cell, they, they're there for the uh, power production in the cell, and we sort of switch off. But I'd like to point out, I'd hope at the end of this presentation, I've persuaded at least some of you, that the mitochondria, in fact, is the central organelle for, uh, for the host response in the immune system. Just a couple of little facts, I'm not going to read through all that, except I'd just like to point out that the mitochondrial DNA itself is only a very small amount of the genetic material that the mitochondria uses. It only uses 17,000 base pairs, which is 37 genes that makes 13 proteins. Whereas in fact, there are 3.3 million base pairs in the cell nucleus. So the amount of mitochondrial DNA is very small. And What's important is that only 3% of the genes needed in the mitochondria, and that's all the mitochondrial genes, just not those from the mitochondria, but those from the host cell nucleus that work in the mitochondria, only 3% actually go into any energy production. So what do the 97% do? It does a lot of other things, and the one that, of course, we're interested in is the immune response. It has a major role in the immune response, and I can't obviously in the space of 10 to 15 minutes cover this, but I'd like to show you why, why our team has been, in part, part of our team has been drawn to the mitochondria because it's central to so many things. This is the sort of picture that we get used to seeing, is that we have a, um, we have, this is in a, uh, human striated muscle, there's the mitochondria, everybody's probably familiar with the structure, dual membrane, inner membrane, outer membrane, etc. So how does the mitochondria influence the immune response in the, hum in a, in the, uh, in the body? It's activation of the immune response, it differentiates in the immune response, and it's to do with survival of the mitochondria itself and the cell itself and the pathogen itself. There are four mechanisms, and I've just chosen this from uh, the reference you see there, uh, from um, Angel Jala, and uh, the mitochondria affects the human, cell, uh, human response in four ways. The obvious way, by altering metabolic function in the, uh, uh, the uh, oxidative phosphorylation, the fatty acid cycle, it can directly activate the inflammatory response. F something called fission infusion is now recognized to play a major role, and I'll touch upon that briefly because it's such a large subject. And I'm going to mention, but not talk about the fact that the mitochondria are right next to the endoplasmic reticulum, and a lot of signaling goes on there that affects the immune cell. Now, the difficulty when you look at the metabolic function uh, of the mitochondria in different immune cells is that there's a lot of variation in what you see in the literature. And one of the problems is, is the immune cell changes. If it's quiet, not doing much, it often uses a different method of producing energy as opposed to when it's active. 
pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory, yes, I do use the terms. Um, it would depend on which, which phase that particular cell is out. And granulocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, TMB lymphocytes often use quite different pathways um, compared to the others. Now this is where our interest first started, and this was from some work. Uh, the main player here was Marek Nalos and our team, and we were doing gene expression studies on sepsis in our uh, intensive care septic patients. And we decided to look at the circulating um, white cells in the, uh, in the patients who had sepsis but were not hypoxic, they were very well oxygenated. So hypoxic was not, hypoxia was not a driver. We took 47 patients and we compared them to 18 healthy controls. And I'll just go through this quickly. And what we found was that when we looked at the gene expression was in fact that, oops, we go back there. There we go. What we found was that Number one is that the genes taking pyruvate into the, into the oxidative phosphorylation cycle were greatly reduced. This is not because there was no lack of oxygen, it just turned them off. Number two, the transfer of, from pyruvate into NAD and lactate was greatly enhanced. So you got lactic production despite having really quite adequate amount of oxygen. In addition, the third thing that happened was you turned down all the genes in the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And um, so what you did basically is you, turned, you greatly wound down oxidative phosphor phosphorylation. At the same time, what happened, in fact, you increase your glycolysis, and so I'm going back here, and wrong button, <coughs> and you actually increase the amount of um, uh, uh, substrates going into the pentose phosphate pathway and you actually produced your energy by, uh, and your NADPH by this method here. So most of the cells in fact now produced energy this way, switched off the TCA and produced a lot of, a lot of lactate from glycolysis. So the interesting thing was despite the lack of, uh, despite the abundance of oxygen, you greatly changed the metabolism in your circulating white cells. And why is this? Because we looked at it more closely and of course one of the problems is when the mitochondria becomes very active with oxidative phosphorylation, you produce a lot more reactive oxidative, oxidative um, species. And that's normally a byproduct of healthy mitochondria and actually a low uh, ROS in fact is a very important signaling uh, functions in the innate immune response. Uh, I won't go through the details there. But if you have too much you actually cause damage to the proteins and enzymes in the oxidative phosphorylation um, pathway. This is, so we went on and did some work, and this is not gene expression work. What we did here is we actually looked at the energy production uh, by using staining in particular cells. And this was a group of patients that we took, uh, there were healthy controls. Then we took people who were infected, but not particularly unwell, they might have had a urinary tract infection. And then we took a second group who had sepsis. And you can see, in fact, despite these people being well oxygenated, the amount of mitochondrial superoxide level was greatly increased the second you got infection. And also the amount of ROS, although not so um, statistically significant, you had a range of uh, greater range and higher range of uh, uh, reactive oxidative um, uh, system. So the first way is, yes, you do manipulate the metabolic pathways in the uh, mitochondria uh, by different cells in different ways for different reasons. But the main reason, the main pathway is that actually mitochondria activate the inflammatory response directly. And what happens here is that uh, you have a thing called uh, NLRP3 and um, it's sitting in here. And it actually when it becomes activated by the mitochondria, particularly the ROS, it automatically causes the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines as shown here, IL-1-beta and IL-18. And um, the second thing that happens is that the mitochondria actually has a mechanism called MAV or mitochondrial antiviral signaling. It will directly attack the virus. It doesn't actually have to go through any other cell. 
it will directly attack the virus itself and it does it via transcriptional factors, NF-kappa-B and IFR. And thirdly, of course, is the thing that we heard about earlier today was that in fact you actually produce, uh, if you've got uh, reactive oxidative species, uh, you actually activate the um, mitochondrial antiviral system independent of a viral uh, um, RNA. So all these things make the mitochondria the centre part of your immune response. So let's just talk about that mitochondrial DNA, because the mitochondrial DNA, I'll just go to the end point here, we know that circulating mitochondrial DNA is associated with mortality in critically ill patients. It's known that if you go into your patient, take the blood and measure the mitochondrial DNA, which is not easy to do, but it can be done, of course, is an effect that's associated with mortality. It's a very small amount of DNA. It only encodes 13 proteins, and all the proteins are associated associated with uh, oxidative phosphorylation. However, it gets released into the cytosol once your mitochondria starts um, misbehaving or doesn't uh, function that well, and that activates the cytokines. And it serves as a damp, which we've heard a lot about already today, because uh, it can activate, uh, which activates the toll-like receptors. So the mitochondrial DNA is a, uh, is a molecule to be taken very seriously. Fission infusion is the third way, and I'm just going to touch upon this with one slide, and is to say that it's now recognised that the mitochondria is in flux. There's a dynamic set up there that, in fact, it either come, two of them come together or one breaks up in two. And a healthy one is where you have a, um, is where you have a what we call fusion, where you take mitochondria that are getting a little old and tired, you put them together and you get a healthy mitochondria. This is the fission is the one that you get worried about because this is the way you break up mitochondria and more importantly, they play a very important role in the apoptosis not of the mitochondria but the cell itself. And there's a lot of work going on in this to see how sepsis in fact encourages the fission and discourages the fusion. Now what's the relevance to managing a critically ill patient which is really the aim of the audience for most of us? Well, to begin with, this is a review from a few years ago, and it's an interesting thought by uh, Mervyn Singer and Jerome Morrell, which is to say, maybe all these drugs that we look at as, as adjunctive therapies in sepsis, maybe mitochondria could be, the, uh, could be the common target, which was an interesting thought. We've just seen this uh, recent publication saying the time is coming when we have to target immunomodulation, so if we're going to target immunomodulation, then maybe we should be looking at ways in which we're going to influence the mitochondrial um, uh, function. Now, just to finish off, I just want to run through a trial that we've got to show you uh, the direction that we're going in with mitochondria. With COVID-19, of course, some of us got funding, many people around the world, and we were fortunate that we got a sizable amount so we could undertake a study looking at predicting disease progression in severe viral respiratory infections in COVID. It's called PREDICT-19. And with this, we were able to put forward a consortium around the world, as shown here, from various places. In particular, I'd like to mention uh, our French colleagues, our Italian colleagues, because you got COVID first over here before it hit this part of the world. And then in Australia itself, we had a number of Australian sites, a number of um, uh, Asian sites, and we collected 800 samples, longitudinal samples from 11 recruitment uh, centres around the world. The samples were all transferred to us, whereupon we analysed the, uh, the microRNA, uh, sorry, the mRNA. This is just to say that out of the 800 samples, 557 were positive for COVID. The others were other uh, viral infections, most of the samples came from our hospital and a nearby hospital. We just published this last month, but what we wanted to say was, look, let's, we've got a lot of data, obviously. You don't do that sort of work with ending, without ending up with a lot of data analysed, but we decided we'd look at the mitochondria. And what we wanted to see was, what, what, what happened to the mitochondria when you had severe COVID? And rather than say you've got COVID or you haven't got COVID, because you know that, why don't we look at those groups of patients who have moderate COVID 
and compared them to those who have severe COVID. What is the change in the mitochondrial function that takes you from uh, WHO class four or five and puts you up into WHO class six to nine where your mortality is much higher? Is it possible to identify which mitochondrial functions differ between these two? Obviously with the idea that if you could identify what happened in the mitochondria, maybe that would be a pathway to, um, to modify the progression from moderate to severe. And so we took a total of 1,623 mitochondrial related genes. Now just remember the mitochondrial genes itself is just a, a handful. Whereas in fact, there's another 1,600 genes which are encoded by the nucleus that do all their work in the mitochondria. So we in fact took all those genes and analyzed them. Uh, this is just the volcano pot that you see in this sort of work where you identify those genes that are down-regulated. You look at all those genes that are up-regulated in these 1,600 samples. And then what you do from there is you uh, go ahead and you do what we call pathway enrichment, which means to say there's so much data there. So you have to take the genes you've got and find out which pathways are affected. And interestingly, what we found was that when we looked at the 10 top pathways that were upregulated, and we analyzed which ones were most, uh, um, most affected, we found, in fact, surprisingly, because it doesn't appear to be a uh, gene related to mitochondria, we thought at the time, uh, the main one, in fact, was one called MMP, uh, uh, matrix, uh, matrix metalloproteinase P9. And we found, in fact, that this was the one that was um, uh, most affected by COVID going from moderate up into severe. And so without going into the details as to why uh, MMP may be doing this, it just strikes us that there's a potential for therapy in this particular case. And um, secondly, there were some other endocrine pathways that were greatly affected in severe cases. So I just put that forward as a way of saying that uh, the time has come that we should really be concentrating more on the mitochondria because in fact, at the end of the day, that's the sort of almost common um, pathway by which a lot of re uh, immune responses occur. And so with that in mind, I think it's my final slide. Oh, one final slide. Viruses do not like mitochondria. And in fact, this is an example of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, in fact, which once it gets into the cell, it creates a protein that goes directly to the host cell mitochondria and destroys the mitochondria itself. The virus, in fact, is aware that the mitochondria is uh, really quite an enemy to deal with. <laughs> this is just one example of how um, uh, protein is produced by the virus and the sole um, uh, purpose of this protein, in fact, is to damage the mitochondria. And it's shown by this group, this is what causes quite marked um, damage in the lung airways, epithelial cells, and causes op uh, apoptosis. So on that note, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, oh, just to finish to say there are the four pathways which I've mentioned already. Thank you for listening. Are there questions or comments from the audience? Maybe uh, I can start with. Uh, just uh, coming back to the 80s, um, in course of septic shock has been demonstrated uh, in the arrangement of the electron transport chain, uh, an higher product of uh, uh, um, oxygen reactive species, and uh, often uh, a derangement also of the scavengers, such as the superoxide dismutase. Do you believe that this may be some explanation, uh, looking at the high level of superoxide or the uh, availability of oxygen, which is plenty, and how this may, in a way or another, influence the immune regulation, in your opinion, or uh, depending upon your results? Very much so. In the interest of time, I didn't go into it, but as you're aware, there is a very complex system inside the mitochondria to deal with excess ROS. And, um, and that happens through regular activities because it knows it's, it's a dangerous side. So yes, I think actually, and as you're aware, there's quite a bit of work being done on the ROS and uh, to, uh, to nullify it. I still think it's a uh, target that we should keep our eye on, we should explore further.
Thanks. Are there questions or comments? Okay. If not, we move. Okay. Okay. Then, thank uh, you very much. Thank indeed. you, Tony. <coughs> Our next speaker would be Manu Shankarhari from uh, Edinburgh in the UK. Is he here, Manu? I haven't seen him. Yeah. Yeah, we are slightly in advance, five minutes in advance indeed. So let's move to the. Dr. De Bos is here. Yeah, let's move on. Dr. Bos, sustained inflammation can be associated with mortality. We are very uh, curious about your talk. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I prepared my talk for Manu to give the introduction to mine. So I will have to explain a bit more about the compartmentalization of um, inflammation. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, as always, this is the team doing the work. I'm merely presenting on their behalf. And I'm going to present the work from uh, several of the PhD students in my team, uh, Nor Boers, uh, Justin de Brabander, and Shikchi Zhang. So I have four take-home messages today. The first one is that we need to appreciate time-dependent changes in inflammation, and I'm very happy to see that several of the previous presenters already tackled time-dependent changes in the ICU. I think that uh, I can make a strong point that sustained systemic inflammation is associated with mortality in the intensive care unit, but also that sustained alveolar inflammation is associated with mortality, which has not been studied very frequently before. And as a last point, I want to make that there is that we need more causal understanding of hyperinflammation and not just the association studies we typically do. So first point first, I think Many of the studies we do and many of the phenotyping approaches we take, we just look at the patient at baseline and forget that we are in a dynamic environment and that things can change with the interventions that we use, but also with the natural disease course. Of course, this is not a new thought and was already published on in the 90s. I'm going to highlight a few papers that were uh, essential in this field. This is one from 1993 on the TNF production in patients who ended up to survive or were diseased during their ICU stay. And even with frequent sampling within the first 24 hours of ICU admission, uh, huge differences were seen between survivors and non-survivors that could not be observed at the absolute baseline. So you see that the, the curves overlay at time zero, but start to differentiate over time, suggesting that it's the handling of the inflammatory response that's important. Similar results were found uh, in patients with ARDS. Uh, these are the days after ARDS instead of hours, with patients who were later to be deceased having higher values of IL-1 beta in plasma. Of course, this is not new, but when you look at this graph, you can see that um, patients who were surviving or non-surviving, they were not really, the data points within one patient were not really linked. So we do not know whether one patient moves up or one patient moves down. This was typically ignored in this kind of analysis, and I would argue that is quite dangerous. Why? Because we really know the importance of grouping. If you have effects over time. It is important if you are increasing in concentration, decreasing in concentration, and there are very sophisticated models now that allow you to study the changes within a patient or within a unit or within a compartment instead of just a whole population of patients grouped together. And there are many challenges in this regard. For example, some patients die once the patient dies, you cannot do follow-up sampling, so you need to take this censoring into account. And this is highly informative, because it's not only the patients who die who cannot be sampled, but also a patient who is improving, is discharged from the unit, cannot be sampled again. 
So I'm going to use a few words in this presentation that you can forget, but that um, are important in order to do this kind of analysis. They are called linear mixed effects models and joint models where, where these kind of analyses are linked with survival analyses. So we know now that we need to appreciate the time-dependent changes. And now I can show you that sustained systemic inflammation is indeed associated with mortality. And I'm going to use two examples from COVID-19, not because COVID-19 is of such particular interest, but it was the first time that we were uh, able to do such large patient cohorts and such in-depth biological analyses in patients who presented to the intensive care unit with the same disease. So I'm going to talk about two studies with COVID-19 patients, a mixed bunch admitted to the general ward or the intensive care unit, who had biomarkers measured at multiple time points, in this case all in plasma. The first one is a cohort from, uh, from uh, Boston in the United States, where they did multiple biomarker analysis with O-Link, and were able to show, using these linear mixed effects models, that patients who were ending up doing worse, had higher severity scores depicted in red, had a different trajectory of several biomarkers compared to patients who stayed on the ward or were um, already uh, ready to go home and were off oxygen. On the ward is blue and off oxygen is green here. So they, I here show two biomarkers. SRH is a typical biomarker of epithelial injury in the lung. And angiopoietin 2 is a biomarker of endothelial permeability. And you can appreciate that the dynamic changes over time between the sicker and the less sick patients are very different between these two biomarkers. The epithelial biomarker RAGE started very high but decreased over time, while the endothelial biomarker angiopoietin 2 was quite comparable between moderate and severe patients at baseline, but diverged over time. And the authors went on to suggest that in the beginning of, uh, the, of these patients with COVID-19, epithelial uh, processes might be more important than at later times. This is a study from, uh, from Amsterdam, where we had patients admitted to the ward or to the ICU, with, all with COVID-19. And we've performed this joint modeling, where we took biomarker concentrations over time and combined that with survival analysis, and then evaluated if a higher concentration of a biomarker over time was associated with a worse outcome. And you can see that there are some differences between patients on the ward and on the ICU in the prognostic capacity of these biomarkers, but also some similarities. For example, IL-6 had very similar prognostic values in the two populations. So what does this mean? How do we interpret a hazard ratio per log 2 increase in a biomarker? That's quite difficult. So I try to make a few uh, examples of four patients who responded differently um, during their ICU stay. And, and this is sort of a way to understand how you could use this for prognosticating your patient. So in all these patients on the x-axis, you see the time after hospital admission. And on the y-axis, you see the concentration of the biomarker. So that biomarker changes over time. And then on the right side, you see the survival probability based on this model. And that there are multiple curves, and every curve starts at the time point where a sample is taken. If you then look at the first patient, the biomarker concentration was quite low in the beginning. And the green line depicts in IL-6 that the survival probability was good. At the second time point, this patient all of a sudden had an increase in IL-6 concentration, and now the predict predicted mortality is about 60%. And this way we can continue to update our progno prognosis of a specific patient. On the other hand, if you look at the patient where we measured C5 over time, you can see that the survival curves continue to improve 
when the C5 concentration decreases over time. While in the, top, in the bottom right, you see a patient with a stable VCAM concentration that still was at high likelihood of dying because the, this uh, biomarker was not cleared. So this can help a little bit in updating our prognostic value of this biomarker instead of just taking a single snapshot. So instead of looking just at the systemic compartment, I'm actually much more interested in the alveolar compartment. So this is again a uh, COVID-19 cohort, although we are validating this now in patients with ARDS without COVID-19. And we have a quite a unique clinical algorithm where we take BALs from patients who are not improving. This algorithm was actually just uh, published in critical care. If you want to see our uh, diagnostic opinions on when a BAL is appropriate. And we took these BALs and we processed them and stored the supernatant from all the patients who underwent such a diagnostic uh, study. And, these, and we measured multiple biomarkers with uh, uh, Luminex at multiple time points in the BAL. The first thing we did was compare the concentration of biomarkers in the alveolar space and in plasma to evaluate what was the true alveolar response uh, that was distinct from the, from the uh, plasma response. And that is depicted on the left side in graph A, uh, and the blue dots are biomarkers that were higher in BAL, despite BAL being diluted, because of course you instill saline and always have a certain dilution in a BAL. So for example, IL-1 beta was much higher in BAL than in plasma in these patients. We then went on and used these biomarkers to evaluate the change over time. So were they increasing or decreasing over time? We were very surprised to find that the uh, in patients who did not resolve their lung injury, their uh, biomarker concentrations in the lung were increasing over time, while in plasma, the concentrations of these biomarkers were all decreasing. And in then in C, it's a similar plot as you just saw for the plasma biomarkers. We found very strong uh, associations between a heightened biomarker response over time and mortality in these patients with non-resolving ARDS due to COVID-19. And this means that our hypothesis that alveolar and systemic inflammation are distinct is, is probably very true in COVID-19 related ARDS, but I think in other forms of lung injury as well. And if we compared the uh, prognostic value of these alveolar biomarkers to the plasma biomarkers. So here on the left, you have the same graph as you saw before, but on the right is the plasma association. You see that for some of these biomarkers, there was also prognostic value in, in plasma, although the hazard ratios were much smaller. But for, for some of them, the effect was actually opposite. So I would argue it is quite important that we look at this compartment before starting any therapies based on on the suggested changes in the plasma compartment alone. We then took the opportunity of a sort of natural experiment that some of these patients were treated with high dose steroids while others were not. We had huge disagreement between clinicians on who to treat and who not to treat. And this was sort of arbitrary on when to start and whom to start. Uh, although we try to always evaluate that in a multidisciplinary meeting. And here we modeled patients who had a um, BAL before the start of high dose steroids and after and matched controls and evaluated that the uh, two most important prognostic biomarkers, CXCL1 and CCL20, were decreased after these patients were put on high dose steroids, suggesting that there are actual biological effects that might improve the prognosis of these patients. So last but not least, I'm not going to go into detail. If you want more detail about these studies, I gave a presentation on it yesterday. I think we need to go much more towards a causal understanding of hyperinflammation rather than just associational studies. 
So one of the, the ways to do that is to use randomized interventions between a treatment arm and a placebo and evaluate the uh, effects of a uh, randomized treatment on the biological effects. This is called mediation analysis. And again, I will not go into detail at, uh, at this presentation, but one of the things that you can, uh, can uh, calculate is the effect of the treatment on mortality when no change in the biomarker was observed. And this way you can elude the, um, uh, the, the, the indirect effect through the biomarker. In other words, is the change in the biomarker responsible for the protective effect of a certain treatment? Uh, and we did that for imatinib, which I will skip now. Um, so, the points I try to make is, if we are studying inflammation, I think we cannot look uh, at a single time point anymore. We need to appreciate the time-dependent changes. It's interesting to do that in the systemic compartment, and there's still much to learn from that. But I also think we should look much more at organ-specific uh, inflammatory responses. For example, at the alveolar response in patients with ARDS. And in the end, we need to har harness the uh, causal understanding we can get from randomized controlled trials and really incorporate this kind of bio biological understanding in those studies. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much for these insightful data on inflammation. Um, are there any questions and comments? Now, um, I, I would like to ask you, can you relate your findings to very old data from Pittsburgh um, that showed um, patients having a much higher risk of morbidity following sepsis concerning, um, concerning cardiovascular um, incidences after having survived sepsis. And also these patients were discharged with a rather comparably higher level of IL-6 in yes. these data. So I, I cannot use this data directly in that regard, but I, I suspect that um, the risks that we see carry forward even beyond discharge. So in many of these studies, we used 90-day mortality, and uh, many of the patients were discharged at day 10 or day 15. And we still see events, even mortality events, after discharge from the hospital, they are not as frequent anymore, but they are still there. And they are still associated with the biomarker levels that we took during hospitalization. Exactly. And that's not a compartmentalized effect. That's a systemic that's effect. That's a systemic effect. Although we also see it for the patients um, who are on the ICU with ARDS. But there I would could argue that it could be a pulmonary response specifically. So I think th this is very important and very interesting, but I do not have good data um, on what causes the late mortality in the patients in this study. You will probably gather the data as time goes on. I have another question. In your uh, COVID-19 population, there were potential other confounding factors depending upon the therapies these patients were receiving, were they, they standardized or they received all the same drugs? So um, it was not the Wild West uh, in our hospital. Yeah, um, of course. <laughs> so it was in many other places. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> In, in the uh, COVID-19 patients on the ICU, um, we have everyone on steroids beforehand. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, uh, that was the same in everyone. Uh, tocilizumab was used in, from the moment the REMAP-CAP trial was uh, published. And we, um, we looked at before and after, and we couldn't find a lot of differences in the alveolar space, but the groups get small quite quickly. And all other interventions were randomized. So we had two studies ongoing, C5A inhibitors and uh, intravenous imatinib, and both of those studies were randomized and we could not find differences between the treatment arms. But did the, the others did not receive any anakinra or JAK inhibitors? No. Okay, thanks. Oh. Thank you. Now, man, you have the right. Yeah. 
So um, we can just recover the previous speaker. And uh, Manu Shankarari from uh, will speak about the from uh, the Edinburgh uh, University is uh, going to speak about compartmentalization of the immune responses. Thank you so much, Tim, and I'm sorry. Previous session overran, so we, we understand um, perfectly. <laughs> so uh, thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just a, a brief acknowledgement uh, of my research funders. Uh, I'm funded through a clinician center towards still, and uh, these are my views, not necessarily of the Department of Health. Um, and I have an intellectual conflict of interest because I run a precision medicine program that kind of asks this question about the <coughs> compartmentalization of immune responses in the context of lung injury. Um, I do have advisory board activity, but they are managed as uh, research funds, so I don't have a conflict of interest. Um, I was going to just touch on three things, given that it's uh, day two in Brussels, um, everybody will be tired. I want to just give, bring out the basic idea and the concepts uh, with some examples. And why do we think it is relevant to study this? And I'm just going to use GMCSF intervention around, G interventions around GMCSF in COVID-19 as an example to highlight why it, we should think as clinicians uh, about this problem. So. So what do we mean by compartmentalization? Uh, between anatomical compartments like the lung and the blood, or kidney and the blood, or CSF and the blood, what we measure as immune state differs. And I think this happens because of a number of reasons, but that's a fundamental premise of this discussion, which is your immune state that you measure in blood may not be the same as the immune state that you measure in the lung or in other organs. And, and this happens because every single organ has got an immune cell that is resident. For example, a lung as a macrophage, liver as kupfer cells, skin as DCs and other macrophage monocyte system, spleen, liver, etc. All of them have got some other immune cell uh, that is resident in the tissue and that is constantly receiving information from the blood that is now activated and circulating. And when we think about uh, the compartmentalization, this kind of uh, cartoon gives you a very uh, clear uh, summary of what's kind of going on uh, between um, cells. So for example, if the, if the primary insult or injury is bacteremia, then your initial insult is coming from the systemic circulation. And that then means that the secondary organs that have lung abscess or something else like brain injury as an example, all of the our endothelial dysfunction leading on to transmigration of the bacteria, etc., could result in activation of the immune system within the organ. And the same is true when you think about it the other way. St uh, primary pathology being pneumonia, you could have a systemic spillover. And this, it is not only that the cells are, the starting point is different, the cell population within each organ is different. And I'm just going to give a very uh, superficial view, overview of this paper. This paper was published in Science a uh, few months ago. Uh, this was led by a consortium that talks about at immune atlases. And in this paper, they essentially have taken, if you look here, uh, there is bone marrow, spleen, lymph node, uh, liver, lung, and gastrointestinal tract. And what they've done is a really unsupervised, deep immunophenotyping of components of leukocyte cell population within these tissues. They then do two different things. They go on to explain the proportional differences and the immune state differences between these tissues. And the senior author for this paper is Sarah Teichman. And as you can see here, as an example, in the lung, as, as we talked about, the alveolar macrophages are much more kind of common in the lung, and the dendritic cells, as an example, is slightly uh, different between uh, different organs. And the strength of difference is shown by the strength, the color of the um, square. And let's kind of move on to a non-myeloid compartment, like a B cell compartment. Again, you see that the Bone marrow has got plenty of pro B cells, whereas the lymph nodes have got the naive and memory B cells uh, that are forming and the naive B cells that are homing into the secondary lymphoid organ. And the same applies for plasmoblast, where 
there is differential kind of presence of gut related mucoid tissue and the systemic <laughs> circulating plasma blast. And if you then take it to the uh, T cell compartment and the other uh, leukocyte compartment, again, you start to see the differences in different uh, kind of variables across different subsets of T cells across tissues. For example, the thing that you see in bone marrow may not necessarily occur in the liver and lung and jejunum. So this brings us to the point that I was trying to make, even though overall lung is sensing or any other end organ is constantly sensing what the blood is bringing in because of the differences in distribution of the type of the immune cell you could see a difference in immune responses that is happening at an organ level that is the whole premise of this compartmentalization and to be fair the people have talked about this before i am not the first one to speak about it but what we haven't done as a community is to go and show that this difference is important and th therefore all of this is just hypothesis still. And how do you do it? And I think Liu has done a, a recently done a study in COVID where you know there is a paired sampling of blood plus BAL as an example and it also brings in a slightly uh, different question. What is the right pair if you wanted to say an immune state is different between organs? and uh, Dr. Van der Poel had highlighted in an earlier talk that actually the only two places you can sample are urine and sputum. You can't sample anything else aside from blood. And blood in itself kind of represents a summation of signals all of these organs receive. So why are we doing this if we, if we don't think that the organ is fundamentally different? It's a valid point. And I think that's why this discussion is useful because we haven't proven that it is or it is not. I'm just going to give you some examples from all of these uh, different studies because this, this gives you a reasoning why this is useful. Uh, there are challenges as uh, is apparent, which is gut and liver. And then sometimes the quantification of the relationship is hard. In blood, it's beautiful. You take a draw of blood, you know what is micro microliter concentration of a biomarker. If you take a lavage sample, like a bronchiolar lavage or an acidic fluid, how do you relate the two? And what, what's a concentration? Because some of the, if you put in 10 mils of fluid, 4 mils, you may be able to aspirate back from a lavage, back from a BAL, as an example. So there are some other considerations that need to be talked about. Some assays measure semi-quantitatively the protein because they're colorimetric. Some assays do a proper quantitative assessment. So there are other measurement issues to think about as well in this discussion. And I'm just going to give you some examples. And this is a study uh, published in Critical Care. What the authors have done is to compare in pneumonia-related ARDS, BAL versus blood, distribution of a bunch of uh, biomarkers. And they also do a couple of comparisons of stratified by shock in the, and in the overall cohort. So if you look at the figure here, this is the BAL fluid to serum ratio of some of the uh, biomarkers. And this is with ARDS versus controls. And ex, uh, ex, as you would expect, there is high IL-8 uh, if you were to sample the lung compared to controls in ARDS. And probably uh, the differences in surfactant is starting to look in the direction that you would biologically expect to see. Now, if you focus on the figure on the right, uh, the authors ask the question, does ARDS with shock compared to ARDS without shock provide you a very different biomarker information? And here, I think here they've compared the BAL fluid uh, to serum ratio between the two populations. Again, there are some interesting differences. You see that the IL-4 is uh, different across the tissues, and IL-6 is different across tissues, and so is some of the chemokines like CXCL10. So, in other words, you know, people are seeing some differences between serum and plasma, and the direction appears to be biologically plausible. But what we haven't seen here is is it in the same direction of change versus ratio is higher. Okay, so this just says that the ratio is higher, but we haven't talked yet about the direction of change. And this is crypto, you know, meningitis uh, from cryptococcal infection. Uh, CSF comparison to blood is probably the most uh, beautiful comparison because CSF is relatively, well, it's supposed to be sterile until you get infected. And whatever cell population that is there is in an inactive state until you get that infection. So any comparison between CSF and blood would probably be a, a kind of a useful uh, comparison. And, um, and this is again uh, the, uh, oops, sorry. Huh. 
Okay. <laughs> so this comparison is again the uh, at enrollment at, and at completion, this is the NK cell proportions. And as you can see, the NK cell proportion in the CSF remains higher than blood even at the pre and post chemotherapy. So it's either that the organ after treatment lags behind to reach a homeostatic immune state, which happens earlier in blood. That may be an alternate hypothesis to uh, think about. And uh, this figure uh, you may have seen in other contexts, but I thought this is useful to uh, just talk through. So when we think about cytokine excess and survival status, the thing that comes to our mind is that non-survivors have got higher cytokines. That's what we think always, right? And, not, and here is an interesting uh, kind of scenario where um, spleen looks acellular and the lung looks like it's impaired functioning within the, in a sepsis death at sample. So this is work from Jonathan Boomer from Richard Hodgkiss' lab published in JAMA now coming up to 12 years where they take CSF, sorry, where they take lung cuts and spleen cuts post death in sepsis and compared to that of health. So it could be that the organ is in a different immune state compared to blood because when you die often you are more inflamed or whatever. There are, as I said at the start, we haven't quite figured out the mechanism. We're still postulating different mechanisms. So one hypothesis is that the autonomic nervous system has a significant impact at the organ level and that's why yes. we may see a difference. There is also the hypothesis put forward by Miguel Suarez and Metchitov that there may be differences in tolerance of the disease by alteration of the state within an organ. I mean, that is quite plausible that, you know, you don't see every immunosuppressed patient dying despite being bacteremic because there is some other mechanism that is happening in their context. And the loss of homeostasis during inflammation could separate out the immune state from the whole body being in the same immune state to tissues being slightly different. So, you think, so come on, what, what, what does it matter? And if we've talked about it now for 10 minutes, uh, does it re who cares? So I'm just gonna give you a very simple example. It's an extreme example to just think through the problem. So let's imagine that the, you got two immune states, that is excess inflammation and immunosuppression. Those are two immune states that we have. And we can measure it with a test. And if you then have a, a measurement for the organ and a measurement for the blood, and you can imagine a scenario where you could say that the blood is excess inflamed, organ is excess inflamed, blood is immunosuppressed, organ is immunosuppressed, so or not. So if you then say, okay, this is now a two by two table, can we now think about what is similar? So you can have the organ and blood in the same immune state, immune excess inflammation or immunosuppression. If that is the immune state that the organs are in, what you give based on the blood measurement is absolutely fine because you would, in the excess inflammation, you would give uh, anti-inflammatory drugs and the immunosuppression, you would give immunostimulants like IL-7 or GMCSF or interferon gamma. The problem happens clinically when it is not in the same immune state. So let's take a very simple example where the blood says it's immunosuppressed, which is this uh, scenario and the organ says there is excess inflammation. So if you give an immunostimulant based on the blood sample, you might actually worsen the excess inflammation in the organ. That's the point that I was trying to make with all of this 10 minutes of talking about the immune system. And the GMCSF example is a good one because GMCSF uh, uh, is now a thing that we kind of think about a lot. Uh, in COVID, people have tried both giving GMCSF and blocking GMCSF through the inhaled route and through systemic route. And you can see why this could be a hypothesis that each of us want to pursue because of the differences in the potential differences in the immune system. And uh, the GMC itself treatment hypothesis comes from the fact that there is macrophage epithelial cell crosstalk and therefore the stimulating the alveolar epithelial cell at a right time might enhance uh, repair of the barrier. Whereas the anti GNSF folk think actually there is quite a lot of CSF floating around in patients with COVID-19 especially when they get really ill and therefore blocking the GMCSF may actually be better instead of, act, instead of worsening the lung injury by activating neutrophils even more. So, second last slide and I'll stop. So, in the context of uh, acute injury and infection, you can then uh, use this 
uh, HLADR as a surrogate for GMCSF therapy, and you can actually think through the four scenarios that I uh, put up in my earlier uh, slide. So uh, to summarize, what I was trying to say over the last 10 minutes is that blood remains your best window for immune state assessment. But if we fundamentally think that some of the reasons why our trials fail is because the organ is in a different immune state, then we need to think about how do we assess that particular problem and say that that is not the reason why our treatment has failed. Thank you so much. Questions or comments from the audience? We got lost. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Having a contemporary immunosuppression, please, Dr. Van der Poel. It's a very good talk, uh, Manu. Um, I have a question regarding that the, 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 the extent to which compartmentalized inflammatory responses may impact the outcome may vary depending on the disease. Um, yeah. So I know that I said that blood may be a good um, sample to measure in because it circulates in the body and it's accessible and it may represent what's going on organs. But let's say COVID-19 may be more lung-related disease than sepsis, especially the, the milder, well, yeah. the, the not um, extended yeah. cases that have been on the ICU for, for two weeks or so. So would you think that, that in these diseases it may be wise to try to obtain information about the lung situation, more so than, for example, in a patient um, with bacterial pneumonia that's been on the ICU for a long time? I uh, 100% agree. I think the COVID-19 and flu are good examples of that because there is literature that the lung infection and the persistence of the, of the virus within the lung macrophages can perpetuate inflammation within the lung whilst the systemically they may not be as unwell. And us finding that lung inflammation because of the presence of ongoing presence of the pathogen because of the lung T cells, macrophage T cell circuit that happens is vital. So yes, well, that differentiation uh, is valid and I think I agree with that point because I hadn't thought about it as differentiating bacterial versus viral and that may be a good way to start um, focusing on harnessing that question. Yeah. Other question or comments? Uh, I may make a consideration, Mano. Uh, the complexity of the picture reminds me a, a, a very amazing aphorism coming from George Bernard Shaw uh, regarding the, the doctors. The doctors are individuals who um, deliver drugs or medications that they do not know to an organism that they know even less. Yeah, I, I totally agree. <laughs> it somehow <laughs> may be true. Yes, it is true. Thanks, Massimo. Thank you. With this, uh, we proceed in our program. We are quite on time, and I call to the stage Dr. Weiss from Jena, Germany. Um, he will talk about disease tolerance as an important concept. Hello. Um, thank you for uh, having me. It's an uh, honor to be uh, sandwiched between Manu and uh, Mervyn to talk. Uh, and actually, Manu just have um, has opened the stage by talking about tissue tolerance, um, which I'm going to dedicate the next 15 minutes uh, to. Um, so the, I'm going to talk about disease tolerance um, to sepsis. Uh, <coughs> it's important to make a point for those who uh, are prone to immunology um, that I'm not going to talk about immunolo immunological LPS tolerance or about antibiotic tolerance, but rather about disease tolerance refer to some as resilience or, or tissue tolerance, um, which is um, distinct, at least for this talk, um, from, from the other ones. Um, I didn't invent it. That's the, the pioneers for, for the work in mammals, Susan Matsitov, Lush Moita, Miguel Suarez, and David Schneider. Amazing reviews. Um, if you get excited about the topics, um, check them out. 
Um, just as a reminder, so we, we talk about sepsis, and sepsis is infection plus um, organ dysfunction. Um, and it's a very important point that we call talk about organ dysfunction and not damage. Uh, if you do an autopsy on a patient that died from sepsis, you see hardly any damage. Um, uh, so the tissue looks good in a way, but it's not working anymore. So in this study, they, they concluded that the degree of cell injury and death does not account for severity of sepsis in youth organ dysfunction. Now, if we take a step back and we take a perspective of an um, infection biologist, uh, then we can differentiate three different ways of how we uh, face infections. They are termed avoidance, resistance, and disease tolerance. We're going to use this castle to display it a little bit better. Uh, avoidance, the first thing is it's something genetically encoded that you should feel if you see this picture. Uh, it's places of high pathogen loads. We don't really want to go further. Uh, exciting topic. Not going to um, talk about this. Um, uh, resistance, uh, it's not antimicrobial resistance, it's host resistance to infection. This is everything that kills the pathogen. So that's the um, immune system um, that has a negative impact on the number of pathogens. The archer and the guy that throws the stone kills the guys who wants to enter the castle. Now what I'm going to talk about is something else, it is tolerance, disease tolerance to infection. This is everything that makes up this wall. And you can imagine if this was a tiny um, Japanese paper wall, um, the damage inflicted to the castle would be much, uh, much bigger than if it's a proper wall. So it's the inheriting <coughs> capacity of a given cell, tissue organism to withstand stressful um, conditions. Um, and the way you could plot it that way, so at the left side, here you have the, the health versus the microbe number. With increasing microbes, the health declines. And you can assume that there's different genotypes, phenotypes, whatever, that the health does not decline um, as much in the same individuals. It was something that was first described 1894 already by an Australian agriculturist who wanted to improve his maize crops. Um, and the first proof that it really exists is by Raberg at uh, 2009. He took different mice strains and infected them with plasmodium, um, causing malaria. And you can see here that the different genotypes, they do differently. Um, in disease severity with the same amount of infection. And that's something that we call disentangling pathogenesis from the number of, um, of pathogens. And this disease tolerance uh, is not a separate part, it's an inherent part of, um, um, of host immunity and it acts behind innate immunity and adaptive uh, immunity. So it's not something um, completely independent of it. And it's controlled via certain um, molecular transcription factors. Um, you, you're not going to go too much into detail, but a cell is a stress response with master regulators that control these things, and they confer the stress response um, to infection. Now I have to torture you a little bit with mouse data. Don't go away. We end up with a clinical trial for the, um, in five minutes, but I need to show this um, to see, to show you how, how that works. Um, so we're going to go one example more in detail. Ferritin, we all know from circulation as an um, acute phase um, enzyme going up um, uh, during infection. Actually, fer ferritin has two chains, ferritin light chain, which makes the core, ferritin heavy chain, which has a ferry oxidase activity that is responsible for storing the iron. What few of uh, well, what I didn't know before is that ferritin is in, uh, isn't used in sepsis in the liver. Take a mouse, you do a sepsis, CLP, it's a peritonitis model, and everything that is green is ferritin heavy chain. Control mice, nothing. 24 hours after CLP, the liver is full with ferritin. And then we ask, so what's the, what's the relevance of it? And in infection biology, if you can, you knock something out, and that's what we did. You take a mouse, you knock out a gene in the liver, you do the same sepsis, the white mice are the ones here that um, are the control mice, normal physiology, 30% mortality, the same that you have at your intensive care units, and if you knock out ferritin, these mice all die. Right? And then in a mouse, you can do something very... Um, that you can't do in humans, you can measure how much pathogens are there. And if you do this, you realize that the mice who die and the mice who do not die have the same number of pathogens in the animal. You can go further, look at organ, organ damage markers. If we said sepsis is dysfunction, uh, AS, uh, AT, ALT, CPK, BAN, all the same, cytokines, also no difference. And this, per definition, is disease tolerance to infection. One dies, the other one not. Um, with the same number of pathogens. 
And now, if you're still interested, why it, um, they die, you can go to the next slide. Um, it's called um, a metabolic, uh, failed metabolic adaptation. So if you look in these livers, they go down in, um, uh, in glucose production. They, they crash in ATP production. They have increased proton leak. You can integrate all of this into flux variant analysis. Um, and uh, this shows you, it's the comparison of a knockout cell versus a non-knockout cell. And everything that's red is increased in the, um, in the knockouts. And what you see, they do not produce glucose anymore. Instead, they suck up the glucose. They do Warburg um, mechanisms. And then the mice die of hypoglycemia, and you can revert it, and so on and so on. That's not the topic of the, um, of the talk. But what it shows you is there's a metabolic crash, independent of the number of pathogens that um, that kills you. And that reminded us about a very interesting story now from 2011 by, by uh, Langley, who showed that exactly the same molecules you could also find disrupted in septic shock um, um, patient in the, um, in the circulation. So survival in the critical ill um, is metabolic adaptation, death in the critical ill, we would pose it failed metabolic adaptation. I think that's something that Mervyn has described already when I was in medical school. Um, <laughs> so this is all nice and this is all infection biology, very cool, um, but what does it help us for the clinics? So, and in fact, um, these pathways can be targeted therapeutically. If you give a mouse apoferritin, which is the empty ferritin shell, you can save them from sepsis. Look at this. Same model, now more, more severe survival of the control mice, 20%. If you give them apoferritin six hours after the infection, they were already septic, you, um, you, can, um, you can save them um, to a certain extent. What about our species? Well, really few evidence. One study, um, sepsis, uh, people who died from sepsis versus healthy controls, not so healthy, normal surgery for other reasons. Um, they took, took liver biopsies and they saw certain genes down-regulated in the critical sepsis patient compared to the other ones. They found a gene called PPAR-alpha. They got a mouse that lacked the gene. Look at this. And if you, don't, if you reproduce that phenotype, you're also more prone to die and it's disease tolerance to infection because if you knock out these genes, no changes in pathogen numbers um, in, the, uh, in the animals. What else? COVID. Maybe we know that the CT values as a surrogate for maybe pathogen loads are not different um, between asymptomatic and severe critical ill children. We know that mortality increases with age, and we know that the CT values are not different um, over lifetime. This again disentangles disease severity, at least from the delta CT values. It's just a surrogate, right? right? Um, but at least something. But then if you take a lung biopsy of these patients um, and you compare young prone to survive versus old prone to die, you find genes that control tissue damage um, defense mechanism as in the mice who are downregulated in the ones who are more prone to die. Tissue damage control disease tolerance to infection. But it's a little bit tricky to do it in human because of the accessibility of the compartments of something that Manu just touched. We can get the blood, right? But we hardly get livers. We never get kidneys. Uh, adipose tissue from inside in a non-surgical patient is very difficult to get. So that's something that's very difficult to study. Um, the assessment of pathogen load in humans, almost not possible. Um, and we're very good at, you know, measuring microbiology, who's there, um, how much antigens they produce. We're good in studying the immune system, HLDR, inflammatory markers. We're not good at studying metabolic adaptation and parenchymal responses in humans. Um, I was just recently um, joined up with Chris Seymour, who presented at the, um, yesterday um, some attempts to study disease tolerance readouts uh, in humans. We hope there's, um, there's more to come. Awesome. Can, I go, can I go back? Yes. Now, I've shown you apoferritin working in a mouse, but that's useless because your pharmacist does not have apoferritin hanging around. Or if they have, please call me. But we could not find anybody. But would there be ways to target disease tolerance mechanisms in humans? And um, potentially there is. Um, 
we are used to repurposing of drugs, right? Aspirin, allopurinol, phenacyl, sildenafil, all used for different, uh, all dif different indications um, at the beginning. Um, now used for different indication, classical repurposing. And then comes this paper from Luis Moita from Portugal, who used anthracyclines um, and showed that they induce a DNA damage response mediated protection against severe sepsis. I was going to show you this, uh, this one slide, took the mouse, same model, gives them epirubicin. It looks at outcome and pathogen load. Look at this. Um, survival, control mice, all die. Um, and then this is timings. Zero hours, so at the time of sepsis, 3, 6, 12, 24 hours after sepsis, the mice survive. And it's disease tolerance to infection because no changes in pathogen loads. And with 24 hours after infection, we suddenly are in a window that might be clinically relevant um, for us uh, to come. And this is something that we are doing um, right at the moment. It's a phase two trial um, called epirubicin for the treatment of sepsis and septic shock. I wanted to give immediately epirubicin to 300 patients with sepsis and see what the outcome is, right? But the authorities said, ah, you cannot do this. Um, it's a toxic drug. It's contraindicated in sepsis. Um, you need to go slower. So we did a dose escalation trial Inclusion criteria, sepsis, septic shock, and we give different dosages um, to end up with the mouse dose of 50 milligram per square meter, which is approximately 10% what you get in chemotherapy. Uh, we just had a fourth patient this week, um, so it's ongoing. Let's talk in, in two years what comes out. And the idea is if that works, then potentially later uh, we might go to a phase uh, three trial. Something else, also Luis Moita, tetracyclines improve disease tolerance. If you infect the mouse with a um, tetracycline-resistant E. coli, it improves survival. That data um, uh, controls, uh, these ones get dox doxycycline. They're all infected with a doxycycline-resistant bug. It's disease tolerance to infection. And it appears to act via the mitochondria. Complex <coughs> 1 and 2 are up. Complex 3 and 4 are down. Um, it doesn't go into it, but, you know, again, another drug that would be um, available. So maybe what are we heading to is the golden age of disease tolerance. Maybe not. We'll see. We're the first steps, right? So, um, well, you know, the, the, the stories of, um, of the antibiotic development. Actually, it started a little bit earlier with pyocyanase by Emmerich and Löw, 1899. Disease tolerance was discovered at the same time, 1894. We discovered 60 years later, and only now we get to see it first in flies, in mice, um, with the first drugs that more, on a molecular way are able to um, manipulate um, these uh, parameters. And I want to finish with this slide. So disease tolerance lessens severity of infectious disease without decreasing pathogen numbers. There's direct genetic and and pharmacological evidence in Drosophila and mice that disease tolerance can be monitored and manipulated. Assessment in humans is challenging. Um, the clinical application, if uh, it's an in infancy, and the scientist asked, could tolerating disease be better than fighting it? Uh, maybe not better, but maybe adding up to the tools that we are already having it. Um, and with this, I thank you for your attention. And don't forget to come to Jena for the sepsis update in September. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Weiss, for these thought-provoking uh, comments. Um, are there any questions, further comments? Mervyn. Thanks, Sebastian. A very lovely talk. Um, it's just an aside, but interested to hear your views. Um, recently, there have been a few papers out in patients with solid organ transplantation who um, have become septic, and often they're chronic, they've had their liver transplant or whatever, and the risk of dying is lower, much lower. And I, I, it's interesting, and it, when I read that, I thought, could that be disease tolerance? You know, the, the fact that they can't respond. And we've seen, we haven't published it yet, but we've seen similar in our hemoncology oncology patients. They get bacteremic, but very rarely need to come to the ICU. Yeah. So again, is this iatrogenic induced disease tolerance? Could, could be, or could be, you know, um, um, how far, how long after? Um, straight, straight after, or? Yeah, so they get their chemo, and then we followed them through, and yeah. um, quite a large number get bacteremic, but, you know, they may, yeah. may get a fever. Ah, and, they they yeah. get chemo as well. Yeah. Yeah, could, could, 
could very well be. I mean, so I showed epirubicin. There's another one for, topo, for, for other topoisomerase inhibitors that also appear to induce the damage. So, so what they do is they do induce a little bit damage, and then they induce a strong damage response. And if you then get the infection, that's the idea. You get less prone for metabolic failure and tissue, um, tissue dysfunction could, could very well be, yes. There's another one uh, that, that I haven't touched upon, is radiation also do, does it. So there's early studies, which you might be aware of, right? That, um, and you, can, you cannot cure, but you can decrease the amount of uh, pneumonic deaths with uh, radiation therapy. And this doesn't target the pathogens. It induces radiation damage to the lung, causes radiation or damage response, and then they're less prone for organ failure. Mm. Uh, works from, this, from the 60s, uh, 70s, right? Yeah, good yeah. point, Mervyn. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of data that patients with c uh, chronic bowel disease, like Crohn or so, colitis, mm -hmm. are much more resistant towards peritonitis mm -hmm. and sepsis, and this may be the same effect, I think. <coughs> Sorry. So one question I have. Um, should we be less concerned about pathogen load in the future, or should we still try to fight the pathogens? No, I mean, this is... This is uh, um, th we should still be concerned uh, about pathogen loads and you know, getting away with, with the pathogen loads um, and, and destroying them. I think, so what this speaks to is those patients who, so two things, first, the ones who are infected and develop organ failure, right? So maybe if that works, we would be able in a high risk population to prevent organ failure. So the um, going from infection to sepsis, another one, is um, those who have been treated with, an, with antibiotics for three to five days, uh, targeted therapy, um, blood cultures are sterile, and still an organ failure. There's nothing really we can offer them besides organ replacement therapy, um, and potentially that could be you know, a molecular way um, of alleviating it. Uh, but this, again, is like with the um, immune response, it's not one or the other, it's one plus the other. It's for the 30% uh, that we cannot save, and it's for these maybe 50% who leave the, the um, intensive care unit not healthy again, but uh, with long-term consequences, uh, it's, it, if it works. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> the ancient Latin used to say dulcis in fundo, which means the sweet in the end. And it is why <laughs> we have here <laughs> my good friend, Mervyn Singer from London, and uh, as always, there is a very provocative uh, title, targeting uh, treating fever or normothermia. Lovely. Thank you very much, Matthew. I've got a feeling that I've got like BO or something because everyone's down the far end. I'm thinking, do I smell? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the chairman smell, but no, I couldn't possibly tell <laughs> it. Um, yeah, actually, it was lovely. You know, I really enjoyed the, the talks before, and I, I think of myself more like it's a smorgasbord, you know, Manu was the tasty topping, uh, Sebastian was the meat, and I'm the dry bread at the end. Right, treating fever, should we? Uh, Thomas Sydenham was uh, so-called the father of modern medicine in England, but this was, uh, you know, 400-odd years ago. And he said then, acute diseases such as fever and inflammation are a wholesome, a healthy reaction of the organism to meet the blow of some injurious external influence. So he recognized that inflammation was necessary. <laughs> fever is a mighty engine which nature brings into the world for the conquest of her enemies. <laughs> I also like this quote, the arrival of a good clown exercises a more beneficial effect upon the health of a town than 20 asses, donkeys, laden with drugs. <laughs> he knew something we have to relearn. So pyrexia is associated with better outcomes in sepsis. So there are lots of studies showing that patients on arrival in the emergency department Essentially, there's an inverse correlation. The higher the temperature, the lower the crude mortality. And you can see here, it's <laughs> a sort of linear relationship. And this is a, a, a decent study, decently sized uh, numbers from um, Sweden. And Nate Shapiro, who's at the meeting, uh, speaker um, from Boston, showed the same. So you had 
an increased risk, if you used hyperthermia as your reference, you were more likely to die if you were normothermic, and you were even much more likely to die tenfold odds ratio, ten odds ratio, if you were hypothermic. We are fixated, aren't we, with lowering temperature. It must be bad. <gasps> Let's lower temperature even more. So in the good old days of targeted temperature management, there was the idea, let's septic patient hypermetabolic, let's cool them down even more. The animal uh, literature said, maybe not such a good idea. This is uh, from <laughs> lizards. And uh, what lizards do when they get septic, they actually look for sunshine. They actually come out of the shade to get some heat. And in this study, uh, this type of lizard was given aspirin. And uh, you can see if my pointer works, yeah. You can see basically they were afebrile when they were given the, uh, the aspirin, so no doubt they felt better because they didn't have a temperature, but they all died within three days, whereas the febrile lizards carried on living. Clinical trials, so this trial from France with severe bacterial meningitis, cool the brain down, make it less metabolically active, had to be stopped early because of harm, and the CAS trial also from Scandinavia, worse outcomes if you were made hypothermic. So let's ask the question, is fever protective, and if so, how? Lots of potential mechanisms, obviously heat shock protein, so named because they're induced by heat by temperature are increased and there are other mechanisms but you know heat shock proteins we heard about ferritin s100 you know the whole load of things have a whole variety of actions anti-inflammatory immunomodulatory reduce oxidative stress anti-apoptotic etc and having a higher temperature may actually be beneficial so a few lab studies um, on the left is um, an old study looking at the growth of malaria in a culture with obviously erythrocytes with malaria uh, parasites inside. And you can see they multiply the parasitemia increased far more if the culture was incubated at 37 degrees versus 40 degrees. Likewise, on the right, uh, uh, a pneumococcal meningitis model in rabbits. Again, an inverse relationship the bacterial growth was inhibited at lower temperatures. And here's another one, another meningitis model, this time with Haemophilus influenza. And again, you can see that in CSF and blood, the growth in colony forming units was much higher at normothermia compared, or temperature equating to normothermia as opposed to hyperthermia. How does the immune function function, the immune function function at uh, higher temperatures versus normal temperatures? So in this uh, model, bacterial peritonitis, in mice given Klebsiella, if I remember rightly, you can see having a fever was protective. There was a doubling in more, a halving of mortality, but <coughs> all of the animals died and died sooner if they didn't generate a fever. And they looked at, again, organisms growing. So you can see in blood, peritoneal fluid, lung and spleen, the growth of bacteria, certainly after 36, 48 hours, was much higher in the animals where there was no fever. And likewise, you see a differential response in terms of cytokine production. Bacterial growth. This is, the graph is slightly weird, but it's the change, or the fall, rather, in MIC, so the minim minimum inhibitory concentration of an antibiotic to kill the bug. And so it's the other way around. But you can see as the temperature gets higher, and these are a whole variety of different bacterial strains, you can see the antibiotics become more effective. So it's an in vitro model, ex vivo model. But you can see <laughs> that they're more effective at 40 degrees, 39 degrees, compared to 37 or 38 so the big question is, should we increase temperature? This is uh, actually a fairly nasty man by all accounts, even when he was practicing medicine. I think, unfortunately, he had um, uh, links with uh, uh, the Nazis, etc. So uh, 
He's not one to be glossed over uh, in, or praised in history, but he did win a Nobel Prize in 1927. So he was interested, he was a psychiatrist, and he was interested in neurosyphilis, dementia paralytica, and he thought, well, let's use temperature to try and kill the parasites or affect, oh, sorry, the, the syphilis and uh, improve uh, tertiary syphilis. And he gave these patients malaria and claimed great results. They got a temperature they got better, he claimed, and uh, won the Nobel Prize in 1927. More recently, Richard Hotchkiss, a much, much nicer man, and Anne Drury was the lead, did this really interesting study. They're based in St. Louis, and they randomised 56 ventilated patients who were septic but normothermic at baseline. And they were randomised to either getting standard care or actually warming them up to one and a half degrees or more above their baseline temperature. And you can see they got good separation between the groups. Interestingly, small numbers, but there was a mortality benefit. Mechanism, they're, obviously their big interest is immune function, and they found there was zero impact on HLA-DR, lymphopenia, etc., the things that their, you know, their research interests focus around. But really interesting. Mortality benefit from being warmer rather than normothermic. So in summary, fever in sepsis appears to be a protective mechanism rather than pathological. Multiple mechanisms can be invoked, immunomodulatory, antibacterial, heat shock proteins, etc. Yet to have the large scale trial, but I think the Drury study I've just shown you is really, really intriguing. And on that note, thank you for listening. At the very end, I may conclude that my mom was right, telling that, let the fever vent. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, completely. Okay. So did she give you paracetamol or aspirin, or not? Not. <laughs> there you are. And look at you today. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody who wants to ask questions or make comments from the audience? Please. So from a oh, you've got clinic, cl clinical standpoint in the ICU, how do you go about when it comes to fever and paracetamol? Well, I'm something. now, you know, actually for the last few years, I, I try and ban paracetamol. Um, because, you know, again, we're all fixated and nursing staff, junior doctors on treating numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah if the patient has pain, different matter. But just treating a temperature, yeah. mm. I, you know, put the bear hugger on them, give them paracetamol. I go, oh, no. And if they do, I cross it off so they can't give it. You know, because I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute, it's adaptive. The evidence suggests it, it's adaptive. I haven't yet gone down the Drury line of should we warm them up, and I think it would be really interesting to do a trial in these normothermic patients. But now, you know, when do I lose my nerve? How high should the temperature be? So I get a little bit uncomfortable, you know, because the nurses all moan at me if the temperature's kept above 40. But if it's 39, I'm now leaving them alone. You know, whether it's right or not, I don't know. We need the trial, but I think there's enough evidence to suggest we shouldn't be aggressively cooling them. I don't know if anyone disagrees, agrees. Please throw comments at me. But, you know, we're brought up wanting normal. And when you're ill, normal might not be the right target to aim for. Well, thank you then. Philosophical uh, yeah, conclusion. <laughs> conclusion. And we thank all the speakers for this excellent session and all the resilient uh, uh, audience that remains until the end into the room. Resilience, yes. <laughs>